All right, it's six o'clock, so we are going to get started here. Uh, welcome to the Hadley Public Schools School Committee meeting, August 31st, the last day of August 2020. September, here we come. Uh, is there a motion to call the meeting to order? So moved. Second? All in favor? Aye. 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 All right, I know of one adjustment to the agenda, and that is that we wanted to add a discussion around a recent um, resolution on testing that was shared with us from the Lincoln Sudbury School Committee. Uh, so we'll add that as a, another discussion item uh, to the meeting. Are there any other adjustments to the agenda for tonight? Not to my knowledge. Okay. All right, with that, we will move on to public comment. Um, we do have a number of public participants tonight that are observing the meeting. Welcome everyone, good to see you all here. We're so glad you're here to join us and hear the proceedings for today. Um, if you would like to speak, please uh, raise your digital hand or give a thumbs up or some signal in the participants list so I can see that you would like to make comment. And I see our first public comment, Jane Nevinsmith. Jane. Hi, I just want to remind everyone that voting is not at Hopkins tomorrow, but it's at the new senior center and it will be between eight and eight. You enter between the old and the new libraries. We hope to see you all there. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Jane. Appreciate it. Great. Is there anyone else who would like to make public comment? Um, if you are on the phone and unable to uh, raise your digital hand. I'll just say there's a phone dial in from the last digits are 1786. If you'd like to participate in public comment, please just come off mute and um, you may participate in public comment. Okay. Um, seeing none, um, I would like to make a public comment. I'm going to raise my digital hand and speak as a parent here. Um, I would just like to thank the administration uh, for the Q&A session last week on Wednesday. It was very informative. I really um, appreciated hearing from everybody. Um, Annie, I appreciated hearing your uh, adherence to the time. And I was glad that folks were, uh, I heard a lot of great questions and participation from a number of um, parents and students. So I just wanted to thank you uh, for offering that session and just being um, as responsive and informative as you were. So thank you very much. Thank you. I see a hand raised, Amy Langone. Amy? There you are, you are muted though, Amy. Yep, yep, I, can you hear me now? Yes, we can. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, I'm not 100% certain of the um, format, but I wanted to um, go over some of the questions as a parent um, and in regards to um, some of the um, decisions that were made with the, um, the last school committee vote. And I just have some questions regarding that. Is that gonna come at the end? Um, so let's see, tonight we are going to be dialoguing around um, sports, the Hopkins uh, handbook, Program right. of Studies, School Council, the student survey results, and the public health metrics. So if you're talking yeah. about the public health metrics, we will be dialoguing about that tonight. Did that answer your question, Amy? I think Amy doesn't have the best connection. Yeah, we may, yeah. Oh. Hello? Yes, yes. Now we can hear you, Amy. I'm Go sorry, I, I'm a uh, bad source. Yeah, I had I had stuff about the public health um, aspect of it. So um, if I have questions regarding that, it'll come later. So um, we tend, what we typically do for public comment, Amy, is that um, it, it's not necessarily a QA. and a It's a chance for public to uh, raise concerns, put issues out there for our consideration before we do the dialogue and around the presentations. Mm -hmm. So if there are specific things that you would like us to consider in those public, public metrics, I would encourage you to state those as part of public comment. And then that way we can keep that in mind as we get to that discussion item later in the night. 
but there will not be a Q and A around those discussion topics. Right, right. No, I wasn't expecting a Q and A. Um, I'll just um, I'll just listen in for it, and um, if I have any input, I'll I'll put it in later. But thank you. Okay, and we'd encourage you to uh, email us or call us if there's anything coming out of tonight's meeting that mm -hmm. um, requires further clarification or you'd like to give us input on. Very good. Thank you. Thank you, Amy. Heather, is it a, may I as just a, oh, I'm sorry, you're going to, may I just as a reminder for folks, is it all right just around public comment? Sometimes it's helpful. Just as a general yes. reminder, um, uh, Amy, thank you for asking a question about Q&A. So just a reminder to folks, the policy around public comment is it's exactly that. It's a time for comment. It isn't Q&A or back and forth. If there are questions that the anyone has in the community, we strongly encourage people to send questions that you're looking for answers to, to myself, any school administrator, or any school committee member. You may interact directly with school committee members. I believe they also provide their phone numbers, but they definitely have email addresses, first initial, last name at hadleyschools.org. Any administrator shows so there's a question that anyone has, um, please reach out to us outside of meetings also. And then uh, the comment is just that, a comment. I know sometimes that's confusing for folks. So I just wanted to have that reminder and the school committee policy is it's a three minute limit. Yep, thank you, Amy. And, sorry, Annie. And thank you, Amy. I'm gonna move to Linda Lobel. You have your hand raised. Hi, I wasn't able to attend the Q&A session. So I was just wondering if it was actually recorded because I kept checking the Hadley Public Media on YouTube and, and I didn't see it there. So I don't wanna ask repeat questions that may have already been answered. So I just, just was wondering, it'd be helpful if I could review that or was it recorded or not? So that I will take responsibility for even though this isn't Q&A, the public should know that was supposed to fall on yours truly. And I'm sorry, Linda, I did not do that. What I will say is anybody who was not there, it was just an oversight, it wasn't intentional. If there's anybody who was not able to make it, if you have questions, please, please, please do not hesitate to email me, the building principals, any school committee member or anyone to get your questions answered. And we are happy to do that. Just a complete oversight on my part. Thank you. Okay, are there any other public comments for this evening? Okay, seeing none, uh, we will move then into our presentation and discussion items. So let me just bring my agenda back up here. Uh, the first presentation and discussion item is review of sports guidance. Uh, we have an enclosure for that and Eric Sednick will be presenting that, Eric. You're still muted. You have to find the Zoom window and find the lower left. Alt, Alt A was not working for some reason. He was giving me trouble there, so. <laughs> Eric, I, I can share any screen you would like me to if there's documents that you want me okay. to bring up. Um, I actually, I believe I could do it here, Annie, too. Uh, I'll try here, but if I run into trouble, I will okay. uh, let you know, all right? So thank you everybody for having me on tonight. Um, I appreciate the time the school committee is giving to hear about a proposal for fall athletics, uh, the possibility of fall athletics here at Hopkins. Um, I was tasked with this uh, by the superintendent and our principal to look at the guidance regarding um, athletics and a possible return this fall. And we were waiting on information coming from the Department of Education, the EEA, as well as the MIA before we could really compile a good presentation uh, to give the school committee um, the information they would need to make an informed decision. Um, I'm gonna go through that document in just a second. If you do have any questions, please don't hesitate to chime in um, and I'll answer to the best of my ability. Um, so with that, we'll get started. Okay, is everyone able to see my screen? Getting there. Telling, yep, there it is. Okay. So I'll, I'll uh, try not to read every single line. I'll try and walk through what I feel might be important or uh, really the, the nuts and bolts of what we're looking at for fall sports and the possibility of having fall sports. Um, again, any questions, please do uh, go ahead and ask. So with the uh, current guidance from 
the uh, the bodies that I had mentioned earlier. The MIA had adjusted the recommended fall season start times. Uh, usually they start in late to mid-August. Um, and they, in fact, moved multiple um, season start times throughout the year. So um, the new fall season start time that the MIA had recommended to start would begin on September 18th, 2020, and end on November 20th, 2020. They also adjusted which sports they thought would be um, which would make sense to play during that time period. Um, I'll talk about what sport may have been moved that would impact us in just a second. But sports they had been approved um, or that the MIA would recommend for playing in this first new fall section uh, that would affect us would be golf, girls and boys cross country, boys and girls soccer, and field hockey, which is a co-op um, with Smith Academy. Um, the MIA recommended to move um, football, which we have a co-op with North, Northampton currently, to a second fall season due to the nature and the proximity of the sport. Uh, <clears throat> that start time would currently be set to February 22nd, 2021, and then on April 25th, 2021. Um, the MIA also did make some adjustments regarding out-of-season practice limitations that are typically enforced um, and would allow certain or would allow schools to make decisions regarding practicing out of season um, with the thought that some schools might be interested in practicing football this fall and then playing contests in that fall two season. So more about that um, as I scroll down. So I'll just uh, scroll down here looking at our overall participation for athletics here at Hopkins. Um, the usual guidelines are right here in the middle. Um, we did add that must buy, abide by all the guidelines outlined in the fall athletics plan, which does include guidance um, regarding uh, all the modifications that one would have to make or one should make uh, during the period we are in. And I'll keep scrolling down here. Looking at practice and games and contact spaces, um, we would continue to look to have the cross country train team train on uh, either the local roads, the bike paths, or the perimeter of the school grounds, depending on um, the state of the fields and the field operations and the field construction. Golf would continue to train and play competitions at Holyoke Country Club. Soccer will train and play competitions if allowed to do so um, on one of three spaces. And in any of these spaces on a given field, uh, per the state guidance, you're only allowed to have a maximum of 50 participants on the field at a given time, which are separated in cohorts, which I'll talk about in a second. They would be the varsity field at Hopkins, currently kind of centered in the construction, but fenced in appropriately. Um, the field between Hopkins Academy and the school on the corner of the Russell Middle Street. And the elementary school field, which we typically use for middle school uh, sports during the fall, but might be enlisted for high school sports. Uh, as far as practice times and places and where we would set uh, soccer teams specifically, if they were allowed to participate, that would depend on numbers, timing, uh, a variety of factors that we wouldn't be able to determine yet. We would have to look at numbers, recommendations, approvals, and go from there. So looking at um, what teams we would think would be necessary to field this fall, um, any teams that had a middle school sport, uh, we would look to reduce and eliminate the middle school sport for the fall season. Uh, we'd look to retain varsity and JV teams um, for the soccer teams. Um, cross country and golf typically do not carry more than a varsity team in a given year. Um, and varsity teams will, will be lo no longer or larger than 25 student athletes. Um, JV level teams would be kept on to maximize the participation uh, for all the sports. Uh, but would not have scheduled competitions for the JV programs. We would look at uh, inter-squad scrimmages and using other school students uh, for any sort of competition. Um, but along the short of it, we would only look to run contests at the varsity level in the fall at this time. Sports uh, would all need to abide by the cohort size guidelines when the coaches are structuring the practices. So just some cliff notes, they would divide the students into groups called cohorts for trainings. They must be no larger than 10 participants. 
they must work together consistently for all the practices. So the same cohort would work in the same with the same group from practice to practice. Um, participants can't be members of multiple cohorts, which means you can't switch them back and forth. During training, the cohorts themselves would have to be separated by 14 feet. And um, no event should have more than 25 people on a playing surface for those. Um, they, you can't have comp competitions between cohorts, but according to this level of guidance and for the practice purposes, um, they'd have to be competing separately. So they could compete against each other, but in separate facets. Looking at uh, attendance um, for each practice competition, um, the coaches and their site managers, um, of which I would be one at a game or a hired site manager for a game, will take attendance of all the student athletes. Um, we would include the date, time of play, um, and I will keep a copy of all those records for the entirety of the fall season to be used if we need them. Um, getting on to modifications for fall athletics, there's um, a more rigorous guideline if you look under the hyperlink here, um, but I'll just go over this quickly. So the state separated the sports into three different levels of sport, um, depending on the nature of the sport. So the lower is sports, um, they can be done with social distancing and no physical contact. And there are typically sports that can be done individually. And there's some examples down there for you, uh, golf and cross country being ones that would apply to our school. Then we're talking about moderate risk sports. Um, these sports or activities, they involve intermittent close proximity or incidental contact between participants. Um, sports such as baseball, typical to, or uh, that would apply to us this fall would be field hockey. If we host, if we were participating in that field hockey co-op still and um, the soccer teams. The higher risk sports, um, these are characterized by a high likelihood of close and sustained proximity, direct physical contact. Um, and football would be um, a sport of this nature that would we do looking at for the fall period. So continuing on. So um, these guidelines came directly from the MIA and I took well, so this guideline in particular. Um, so this is something that is expected to be followed um, before we need to ever practice or contest and what a student would attend or coach. So the, we rely on the students and the coaches to be taking their temperature outside of school and to stay um, away from the facilities if they recorded a temperature of 100.4 or higher. Um, and additionally, if anyone was actually found to have um, the COVID virus, they would uh, have to complete their 14-day quarantine until they could return to any sort of practice or gameplay. When looking at locker rooms, um, we were going to look at accessing the locker rooms in small doses. Um, the real strong recommendation we're going to be to be prepared ahead of time and um, you know show up with everything ready to go so we don't have to use the locker rooms and uh, unnecessarily. But just in case uh, an extenuating circumstance, uh, we may ac allow access to locker rooms. Um, after practice and contests, students should not need the locker rooms. We would uh, anticipate that they go directly home after that. Benches, um, according to the guidance, should not be used during practice and uh, personal items that the students have should be placed six feet apart. Um, and there will be no sharing of equipment um, between individuals. If there's sharing of equipment for say a, a soccer ball, for example, then um, during a game, it would be sanitized at multiple points, not only before and after practice, but, or not only before and after a contest, but during the contest as well. And uh, there's some more sharing equipment guidelines here. So to look more at um, recommendations for the individual sports themselves, as I spoke about earlier, golf has been identified as a low risk sport. So that means that the student athletes could participate in practices as well as interscholastic competitions. Um, some of the more specific guidelines that I, that I prepared down for, for the school committee for this evening and for the guidance, um, golfers will only touch their own equipment. Golfers will follow all the course guidelines that are recommend, recommended or mandated for safety at the course. Face coverings will be worn at all times unless the golfers are six feet, feet apart from one another. And that players uh, typically exchange and check each other's scorecards at the end of round, they would not do that. 
Um, golf actually has very few guidelines compared to some other sports because of the nature of the sport um, and the and the distancing that comes as a part of the sport. So full guidelines can be found on this link here. Moving along to cross country, again, another uh, low risk sport. Students can participate in practices as well as interscholastic competitions. And some of the specific guidelines that I pared down for cross country. So the workouts are gonna be done in cohorts similar to what I had talked about with uh, the soccer team. Um, any sort of watches or any other timing equipment would not be shared between participants or coaches. Um, only dual meets would be allowed for contests. Typically, you can have three, even four teams at some of the meets um, if, the, if the course allowed. Um, but uh, the contest would, the meets would only be allowed to two teams at one time. Typically, before a cross country um, event, there would be a practice course walkthrough to make sure that everyone was on the same page on what the course looked like and the proper path. Um, that would be eliminated according to the guidance and um, coaches and athletic directors would work at, with each other ahead of time in order to outline the course to give everyone the best available knowledge without having to physically walk the course and uh, minimize the amount of contact with everyone. Um, it was recommended that wider courses be used to allow for better social distancing and that uh, staggered starts of eight to 10 athletes would uh, be done in a competition. So, they would, the timing would have to be uh, differentiated and uh, athletes have to be set out in groups. Uh, finish line procedures would be changed to minimize contact. Typically, uh, possible sticks are, uh, are usually a good way of um, numbering the student athletes of which, uh, which order they come in, um, but there would be different guidelines regarding that, uh, such as um, staff members or extra help uh, online to to count the athletes and get their names before they come in without while minimizing contact between everybody. And uh, lastly, um, cool down areas would be created for each team to minimize post contest contact. Moving on to soccer. Soccer has been identified as a moderate risk sport. Student athletes can participate in practices as well as interscholastic competitions following modified rules for the state guidelines. Okay, because due to the nature of soccer and the proximity. Uh, and when I go back to the wrong button, bear with me one second. Um, the proximity during play is labeled as more moderate risk sport. So some of the more specific guidelines uh, that were offered and mandated, uh, players are going to be asked to bring their own ball or have one assigned to them by the school, and the ball will be sanitized before and after the practice. Um, soccer is actually, under these guidelines, it's going to look quite different if you if you understand the game, if you've seen the game for and uh, are a fan of it. So there'll be no timeouts during games. Um, typically they're one and a half. Games will be played in four quarters instead of two halves with two minute breaks between quarters and 10 minutes between halftime. The ball will be wiped down and sprayed by the game administrator after each quarter of play, uh, as well as before and after the game. There is no heading allowed in um, the current version of soccer according to the COVID regulations. Uh, there's no placing hands on other players or physical contact or shoulder to shoulder contact, which is legal in soccer uh, under typical rules. There's no slide tackling. There would be no throw-ins. Uh, Kick-ins um, and restarts must be played on the ground. Kick-ins would replace the throw-in and uh, any sort of restart and indirect kick. Uh, if you know that phrase, kick it can't go right into the goal, must be played on the ground. Uh, goal kicks and goalie kicks must not travel over half field, anticipating that they had that rule and so people wouldn't be inclined to head it, uh, going against the no head balls uh, allowed rule. Um, typically, you can form a, a defensive wall of players on a restart, as are eliminated under the current guidelines. And um, for violation of any of these rules um, or in persistent violation, um, even in small, the referees are given the the task of being allowed to card uh, players or coaches for uh, infringement on these rules. Just a little bit about some of the co-op sports that we typically offer during the fall. Uh, field hockey is typically offered. Um, unfortunately, according to what I've heard from Smith Academy lately, they have some logistical concerns with being able to uh, have sports go on. Not so much that the COVID regulations, but logistical to and from school busing transportation with the high amount of students who come to their district from outside of district. So they didn't 
know if they were going to be able to host um, sports this fall. That has not been official yet. Um, but um, if that was the case, then obviously we would not be able to offer a call out if it was approved by the school committee uh, for field hockey. Um, football is a call we host or we are a guest in uh, with the Northampton School District. Um, as I talked about before, um, this actual season has been moved to fall season. So the February 22nd start for any contests. The MIA has allowed um, out of season coaching uh, on a district and principal decision level basis. So schools can actually host practices outside of the season mandated by the MIA. Um, and actually, even according to some of the MIA guidelines, you can appeal to the MIA if you thought the timing of certain seasons wouldn't work for your school district to maximize participation this year. Um, so even that's up in the air, but out of season coaching, which is something that is typically never offered, never allowed, is allowed by the MIA this year. And again, under district principle based decisions. Um, so, so waiting on word from Northampton regarding what decisions they're going to make as far as their fall athletics. Their next school committee meeting is September 10th. So we'll have more information um, when it comes to that um, meeting. But again, if we were to allow student athletes to participate in fall sports on a co-op level at, for football, there would be no contest for this fall. It would simply be training, practice, weight training, things of that nature. Moving on to mask wearing during practices and competitions. So basically the masks are required to be worn at all times unless there's some severely high intensity aerobic or anaerobic act activities. Uh, when distance, distance of six feet or more is not is possible uh, for a quick mask break, and it's not recommended that students take them off completely, but rather than making themselves a quick break, or for any individuals that are unable to wear a face covering due to a medical condition or a disability. Um, and there's just a little more guidance here talking about what that looks like. So as I uh, talked about before, when we're looking at pre and post expectations, um, anyone who's not feeling well, student athlete or coach should not attend any athletic events. Um, the coach should be notified um, by the student or the parent as soon as possible, just to let them know they're not coming. And that's, that's a common practice for any um, athletic team is to let the coach know they're not gonna make it. Um, when students arrive, we would ask that they stay in their vehicles until the coach is there and ready for uh, to begin the warm-up process and the practice process. Even if it's a few minutes before, um, we want to keep everybody separate and safe uh, to the best of our ability. Um, coaches, if they have expectations for students arriving a little bit before early practice to try and get warm, need to be there in order to, for the athletes to be allowed to begin uh, their warm-ups and their stretches um, if that's expected. Um, and students will be required to bring their own water um, their practice to minimize um, interaction. So as far as travel and interscholastic competitions are concerned, um, our conference, the Pioneer Valley Interscholastic Athletic Conference has been um, working hard and made brainstorming different ideas on what to do as far as contests. We can't have our typical seasons lengthwise um, and common thought is it's not the best idea to um, keep rotating the, the leagues or having the same level of interscholastic competition that we would typically have. So um, we've given a larger look at um, playing more of a regional schedule when it comes to competitions this fall and obviously the number of competitions is going to be reduced based off all the guidelines as well as the start date. So um, this is not set in stone as far as um, an official recommendation or official, we would move forward with this way. It's still being, it's still in discussion while schools figure out their individual plans. Um, but we are leaning towards um, a Franklin County schedule. We typically play um, these schools in many of our sports and I play them in all of our middle school sports. Um, the Franklin County area itself has one of the lowest percentage cases in the state. Um, they're all marked white on all the maps of the 
the best level that one can be for a region. Um, by setting up this schedule, it would minimize the amount of schools that we had to interact with. Um, so instead of three teams playing 30 different schools, our three varsity level team, or four, I'm sorry, four, four varsity level teams uh, would be playing nine or eight different schools uh, to minimize the amount of uh, interaction. Um, also that would, if in a case of a scenario of a region saw a spike, it would have eliminate the um, number of sets that we have, have to be taken to restructure the schedule to make it work. Um, we'd be much easier to it'd be much easier to handle with a with a smaller group of schools, especially with the, the history of how their uh, COVID numbers have reflected. So, as far as tournaments are concerned, the MIA. Oh, apologize if you did that button by accident. The MIA is not going to host any tournaments this fall. Um, it would be on us as a as a region. So, say we went to a regional. Uh, only model, we might create, say, a Franklin County athletic or Franklin County uh, champion for this year if it made sense to do so and it was safe to do so and it followed all the guidelines. But there will be no Western Mass or state tournament um, this year. At any home games, home competitions, uh, per the state regulations, we would not allow more than 50 people to attend, and that's including the athletes, coaches, and site manager. Um, due to the capacity restrictions we're looking at this time, we would recommend one spectator per one spectator per Hopkins student athlete. Um, and depending on how the numbers look of students participating in contests, not even allowing um, out of town uh, sports parents to attend or sports parents or guardians to attend just to make sure that the number does not get over 50. Um, as the attendees arrive to the top level co the competition site, uh, they would have to check in that registration or that the site manager would set up, provide their name and contact number uh, for any contact tracing. Um, th there would be six feet, six foot squares or six foot spaces um, where people could attend the contest and except that they were family, they could be in the same space. And uh, all attendees of the contest uh, must wear a mask at all times, regardless of the physical distance between one another. If we were looking at transporting for any reason away contests, um, we would be following the guidelines as set forth by the Department of Education as identified in our district plan, which you can find in the hyperlink here. If for some reason a player was ineligible to participate, if they were injured, if they were suspended from the team, um, if they're a team manager, they would only be allowed to be transported if there was room to do so. But there's a limited number of capacity on the bus, and you typically, a sports season, someone's injured, we have them attend. Um, or if they're suspended for a reason, we would have them attend, but we would limit that um, unless it made sense to do so and there was room to do so. Um, assistant coaches, we would look to have them travel in their own vehicles and meet at the away sites in order to minimize the amount of people on the buses, as well as maximize our room. The last section um, just talks about contact tracing. I referenced this before. So at any home interscholastic competition, um, I would, uh, or I the site manager, would get all the information from anyone attending, um, as well as the information uh, for all the student athletes and coaches on the other team. Um, in order to have contact tracing available in case uh, it came up as a need. So uh, I would work with the fellow athletic directors in the region to try and make that as user-friendly as possible, sending rosters and um, coaching staff numbers ahead of time or coming up with a system to best assist one another um, in case that was a, a necessary. So, so that summarizes um, the fall athletic guidelines that we would like to put in place uh, for the return of uh, sports this fall, Hopkins Academy. Um, again, it followed all sets of guidelines that were put forth by those three uh, governing bodies in the state. Um, I think they're very reasonable recommendations um, and they're being done with the best interest of the safety and wellness of our student body in matter. Um, I, I would like to recommend we go forward with this plan. Um, 
one thing that I do know is that if we were allowed to do sports uh, at Hopkins Academy this fall, I know and I would um, make sure, as well as the principal, would make sure that all of our coaches and players uh, were following these guidelines that we've set forth. Whereas if we chose not to go forward with hosting any sort of athletic participation, um, I believe these students would look elsewhere for participation outside of the district. And I can't say that the bodies outside of our school system might follow the guidelines with as much uh, intensity and uh, follow through as I know we would. So I appreciate everyone's time tonight. Uh, if anyone has any questions. Thanks, Eric. That was very informative. Appreciate the time um, you've put into outlining not only the MIA guidance, but how um, you see Hopkins Athletics approaching that guidance and implementing it. So it sounds like from you that um, the recommendation is that uh, the application of these guidelines are feasible, um, that they've been thought through in terms of the, the resources and the oversight and the staffing that would be required to you know, adhere to, or the support really that would need, be needed in place to support to all those things, thinking about parents checking in, uh, spots on the field, capacity considerations um, and practices and coach guidance. I mean, that's, I'm seeing you nodding. So I'm, yeah. I'm hearing, yeah, that's what I'm hearing. Yeah, I, no, I, I, I think that the guidance that's come down from these bodies has been well thought out. Um, it was only recently that they came up with it because they wanted to do their best and be as complete as possible when looking at if we're allowed to do fall sports, how would it look? Um, so I, and I think they've done a good job trying to make the mess, trying to make the best of a tough situation. So I guess a question for you, and if, if you're not sure, that's, that's fine. Do sure. you know whether MIAA plans to, should they need to revisit these guidelines, um, in any way for more stringency, less stringency, depending on the situation? I would say so. Um, at any point if the district ever felt uncomfortable, the MIA um, would certainly look to the district to make those decisions. Um, but overall, in my experience with the MIA, they do try and get out in front of any problems they might see coming or if there's uh, a pattern coming along. And uh, also in my experience, they put this, the safety of the students athletes first. That's in all their guidelines and philosophy. And, um, a lot of really good people, uh, um, principals and athletic directors, a few of whom I know, took a lot of time and effort to really carefully think these through. And I know they would do the same diligence where if they thought there was something wrong with what they had set up to try and change that and provide guidance along that line. Thank you. Yeah. Hey, Eric, this is Paul. Just a quick question. Um, well, first off, yeah, thank you for being so thorough and um, the presentation was clear. I tried reading it myself, and it's it's a lot to get through. So this was helpful. Thank you. Uh, Not a problem. Sorry, that was a little wordy. <laughs> uh, there's a lot there. Uh, help me understand. So the middle school is also included in these rules. So our recommendation, because uh, typically we have middle school uh, soccer at the boys level. Typically, our numbers haven't been high enough on the girls soccer side to host a middle school team. So we're looking at just basically not having one team, um, just to limit the, the amount of moving parts in this. And uh, uh, we, we feel that a lot of the students could get some meaningful practice um, and the inter, inter, um, personal competition uh, through their other fellow student athletes. Um, some schools are only looking at doing just varsity and not doing any sort of JV level. So, but I, I wouldn't want uh, our student athletes to miss out on uh, an opportunity to train and get some exercise and feel that camaraderie of what it's like to be part of the team. Um, because I know last spring was tough for a lot of uh, our student athletes to not have that baseball and softball season. Um, so any opportunity we can provide, I would like to, but at the same time, um, trying to limit the number of moving parts and be as safe and as smart about it as we can. So we basically have JV and, and varsity teams. Correct. 
And the varsity teams were the only ones with interscholastic athletic competition. So both of the JV squads providing them enough numbers to field the JV team um, would be just training, you know, skill sessions, and inter-squad uh, practices, uh, inter-squad scrimmages or contests to the level that we could provide. What about equestrian? Is that a fall sport too? So the equestrian team is actually a club. Um, I, I work with uh, Ms. Duncan, the equestrian director, a lot because um, just like cheerleading, it's not a actual sport per the MIA, so it doesn't technically fall under my guidance. But um, here at Hopkins, we've, we've tried to treat it as much or as close to uh, as a sport as we can. So uh, Ms. Duncan and I have been talking. Um, she's going to be looking to outline her guidelines as far as uh, the equestrian team would be concerned. And I'm going to help her directly with that. Um, I, I, I asked her to give me a little bit more time so I could get more guidance on our sports. And we could take them and kind of craft them to look at how it would look on the equestrian team. Um, but the equestrian team is actually a very socially distanced uh, organization right now. Um, I believe Ms. Duncan said they would only have one in-person competition and typically they would tape their competitions or uh, video them while they're going on. So they would be extremely distant. Um, but yeah, they're, they're a, a club. We do include them in the sports banquets to, uh, to make sure we celebrate the student athletes uh, in a similar fashion to those, the sports teams. Yeah, great, thanks. Yep. I have a um, comment and a couple of questions. And sure. um, one of my questions, Paul, you just asked with the equestrian team. Um, and in general, when we're looking to look at these sports, are we approving it by sport? Or if we approve, we approve the plan that you've laid out, which is multiple sports? I suppose that's up to your decision as a school committee. Uh, my recommendation would be that we include all the sports and um, I think the guidelines that have been put forth by the MIA and DESE and the EEA, um, they've given a lot of thought and they've made it to a safe level for our student athletes. So I would think, I would hope that we'd go forward with all of them to maximize the amount of student participation. But if the school committee felt that they weren't comfortable with a specific sport coming back, I mean, I would push for any chance to get any of our student athletes out there in any capacity, even if, even if it was only one or two sports. Um, to try and allow students to get back and, and be part of uh, an activity. Karen, to speak to that, I didn't see anything from MASC that pointed towards uh, more granular decisions than participating or not participating in MIA sports. Yeah, not, yeah. not then going any further saying, yes, soccer, no cross country. That, that I just heard it was, uh, at least for reading from their guidance, it was, yeah. yes, school committees do need to, because our, our back to school reopening plan includes remote learning, that we have to vote on whether or not we will approve involvement in sports, which is considered in person. Thank you. Sure. Um, I had two, two more questions for sure. you. Um, what, where does this land for AGS for kids that play sports at the elementary level? Do we have any guidance so, on that? So I do not I have a high school, but. direct oversight for the AGS. Um, that would be a good question for the, probably the Park and Rec Department. Um, if they were allowed to host any sort of uh, clinics or um, a league that they might set up, uh, maybe with the guidance, if, if the school committee approves the high school, to allow sports under certain guys. I don't know if it would make sense then at that point to talk to the park and rec about um, providing the same or similar recommendations to allow um, the young student athletes to play in the community. Thank you. Yeah. Um, and then just to emphasize, I think you made a, a really good point right at the end there um, that as we're thinking about this as a school committee, um, it's, it's out of our control, but it is something to think about that, you know, if we don't, offer sports, um, and this is a really challenging topic in general, but if we don't offer sports, you know, there might be a good percentage of students that will go seek it elsewhere. And so then just thinking about how that might even further expand our cohorts is something I don't think we can neglect to think about. That was it for now, I think, for questions. Thank you. You're welcome.
Eric, I have a, a quick question. Um, the season is meant to start on September 18th. Yes, is that's that, correct. Is that when training will start or is that when games would start? That is when training will start. And typically, okay. typically the MIA requires that you do 10 days of practice before you can participate in your first competition. Um, so, yeah, it would definitely be just training. We have to make sure um, that all student athletes are healthy enough to participate in competition. Um, we actually have a school or an athletic policy that if a student comes in to a season late, we require that they do the 10 days of competition to make sure that they're physically able to participate in it, as well as um, the fact that the students were working hard and were there for the preseason and should, they should be given their due uh, if someone chooses to come late and are accepted into the program. Okay, that's great. Right. Uh, I just wanted to add that um, when this document was first released by uh, MIAA on, I think it was August 17th, I think I got my hands on it on August 21st, I read through the 13 pages and it is dense reading, but actually it's fascinating the level of detail um, and the level of thoughtfulness that this task force, this COVID-19 task force they assembled put together in really examining every sport and the level of risk and all the various guidelines, um, the engagement of public health people to principals and superintendents to, um, I, I think there were even bus people involved, just so, um, there's so many moving parts when running programs like this. And it's evident that they really took that leadership position when putting this out. I was really impressed. Um, so I, I do feel as though there's a lot of caution built into this. And, um, and that was what I was hoping for. And it was really heartening to see that. Yeah, they, um, they came out with the general guidance for like the overall sports and how the seasons were gonna look and what they thought as a body. And then they tasked the um, individual sport committees uh, to go forth and really examine their sport on a very specific level to make sure that they were covering all their bases and allow the people who were most involved with it to really get down to the nitty gritty of what it would look like to practice safely. Um, so they, and they did a fantastic job. Um, I too want to underscore what you um, said earlier. I, I know there's um, quite a few community members who have been um, taking their um, student athletes outside of the community to engage in um, competition. Mm -hmm. um, and I wonder with MIA historically, when you're um, at least at the varsity level, perhaps also at the lower levels, when you're engaged in a school sport, you have to cease those other activities. So you really are sort of minimizing the risk of that kind of contamination in another state or in other communities that aren't as diligent. Mm -hmm. um, can we assure that that is the case if we were to um, turn on sports? So what the MIA has um, trying to make it so that the, the school is the most important team is, is a rule called the bona fide player rule. So what that does is that says that if a student athlete is a member of a team, they can't miss a practice or a competition, they can't miss a team event for an outside of school sport. Um, they did make an exception to that the last few years and now practices on weekends are no longer part of that rule uh, because of the level of outside competition they were running into. Uh, so they modify it that way. So that doesn't totally eliminate outside of school um, sports programs being played, but it does limit the access, right? So if, if you're required to be here and that includes travel time too. So if you're required to be here for a four o'clock practice at the time before and the time after and everything between. So, um, but there's nothing in the MIA guidelines that say you cannot play anything outside of school. It just, the, the school sport has to be according to those guidelines, the most important and the priority. Um, so. Okay. Thank you. Yep. Yeah. Eric, just to um, kind of go back into that. So with the, uh, weekend not being a priority for the, the the high school, right? So that means that a kid that is playing soccer at Hopkins could go play club on the weekends, right? They they could, yeah, they very well could. Um, and, and again, a lot of times 
uh, teams will practice on the weekend, especially varsity level teams, like some like basketball teams practice like almost every Sunday or soccer a lot on right. Sundays. Um, so just because a just because the MIA bona fide player rule says that you cannot miss or you can miss a practice on the weekend and will be a violation of their rule doesn't mean that we couldn't uh, apply it on a athletic, um, our own athletic program level. And I, I speak to this at my parent meetings to, when I talk to my coaches about it. So just because the bona fide player rule says, okay, if you miss a practice on the weekend, it's not a bad violation of that rule. We could, as an athletic program, choose to enforce it to that level, if not worse, if we, if we chose to, as you know. Um, I, I was talking to my coaches about that to make sure that they let their players know that just because it's not a violation of this rule specifically doesn't mean there's not consequences for this in a program. And I would defer to my coach's decisions depending on how it went um, after looking at the situation. So, okay. Yeah, no, I've ran into that in the past in, in coaching. Um, yeah. One other question that I just kind of came up is there, uh, and maybe I missed it in the presentation, but is there a recommendation on how many games uh, can be played or matches can be played in a week? Uh, so typically the MI has that guidance. Um, it, there's a there's a whole form that says which sport, um, how many events you can have per week, and how many weeks you can do it, and it's got that all lined out. Um, there has been no communication regarding modifying that specifically, but the general feel uh, of my talks with the other athletic directors in our conference is that we're looking at a, a reduced number of games just out of the principle of, of the situation. So um, just because it's a shortened um right. time frame uh there's no indication that i've had that anyone's going to try and schedule more games to pack in what you would typically do during a soccer season into a shorter time span um we're looking at just again trying to get the students active get them engaged get them a semblance of competition especially for like our senior student athletes whom this might be their last chance to play soccer uh or run cross country or play golf or uh participate in one of our co-ops so, yeah, so that's the, the thought is uh, reasonable number of games, again, get the competition while minimizing the amount of contact and just elastic contact. So. Awesome. And do you, I mean, I, I mean, you talked a little bit about it, but do you have a, a feeling one or the other on uh, end, of, end of season championships? And really, I guess I'm thinking more about soccer. Everyone else is going to be pretty spaced out, but I guess that's the. Gotcha. As far as timing of what it would be? Or just whether whether Pioneer Valley or whatever conference we organize should have one. Gotcha. So I would like to think if if the Franklin County Athletic Directors, if we if we go forward with the with the thoughts that we currently had of just participating as the Franklin County team, I don't see why we couldn't put together uh, a mini a tournament following the guidelines at the end. Um, you have to follow certain guidelines with soccer because it's uh, a moderate level sport. Um, so I anticipate that we would be able to put something together as long as you didn't have pitfalls of, um, spikes in cases or something of that nature that kind of derailed the structure of what you were trying to set up. Um, uh, but the good thing about having a only eight or nine teams participate in a, in a league and kind of a season is that if say it was just one school that kind of fell on hard times, you could probably still structure it to make it work. Um, again, I, I would be, I would, I would push for, um, trying to have some sort of competition, some sort of tournament to the best that we could, again, to really, especially for our senior athletes, provide a healthy sense of competition to the best that we could, um, if we're able. So. Thank you. Can I just add to that, Eric? We would check though, as you said, first with the MIAA, but also with the executive office of uh, the governor's office, because the amateur and youth sports guidance comes out of the executive office too, where they broke down the levels and what's allowed for each type of sport. So certainly just so the public knows that um, all of that would be subject to approval beyond just the school committee votes whether or not to participate. And then in terms of anything that we have any questions about as to whether or not something that we're thinking of doing as part of that participation falls within the recommendations, we would ensure that we got approval from the appropriate governing body, whether that was the MIAA or the Executive Office of Energy and Environmental Affairs actually are the ones who issue the guidance on amateur and sports. 
So I say it may there. not be our decision to make, Ethan, but it doesn't mean we wouldn't ask. Yeah. yeah. I'll chime in and just say I support this. I think Eric, you, I think as Humera said, there's a very well thought out document from the state. Eric, you have added your your skill to it, and I have a lot of faith in you to implement this well. I think that'll be a question, right? Is well, this is good on paper. Is it really going to be implemented? Just knowing you over the past years, I think you're really good at uh, knowing the rules and making sure we're all adhering to the rules. So I have a lot of faith in that. I think outdoor um, outdoor events will reduce risk, uh, and I think these measures are already dramatically reducing what's already a pretty low risk out there in our communities, thankfully. Um, and I just I think. Uh, outdoor activity, I think exercise activity is going to be just so important for kids, um, if, especially if they're stuck home all day behind a computer, right? They're going to need some outlet. So I think some of the things we might need to think about too are transportation. So how do we get to some of those kids if if they are working uh, remotely? How do they get to school? So maybe as Annie, as we did with uh, asking families uh, whether they have good internet connectivity. We can ask families, hey, if you're interested in your child participating in sports, maybe they're and but you're going to have difficulty getting the child to practice. Maybe that's something we can we can talk about. But I support it as you proposed, Eric. Thank you. Thank you, Paul. Appreciate it. And as the school committee begins to deliberate, as you know, so what Heather said, and it's clear the school committee votes as to whether or not to participate. I would be remiss if I didn't bring up the point that Ms. Camuso, I believe, brought up at our last school committee meeting. We would assume that if the school committee um, decides to participate in the extracurricular program of athletics, that they also would allow students who participate in other extracurricular activities, clubs such as equestrian club or drama club, that if their clubs met the guidelines set forth by the appropriate governing body, with the Department of Elementary and Secondary Education and were approved by the principal, that they too would have the option if they chose and could meet those guidelines to meet in person so that our actors and our athletes get the same treatment in extracurricular activities. So as you deliberate, um, we would ask that you entertain this is that if extracurricular activities meet the plan requirements and have been approved by the either the AD and or the principal that they would have the same option. So Annie, that seems very fair to me. Um, it, are there rules safe or banned? And there are. There are, yeah. And a lot of the club advisors have been sending me plans for the last few weeks. So they have two sets of plans, both for remote and for in-person, but there are um, recommendations for band, chorus, and drama, and the arts in particular. Great, thanks April. And I, I echo what Paul said. I'm supportive of this plan, um, especially in thinking that the going back to athletics and not necessarily all of the clubs, that this initial discussion we're talking about are outdoor athletics um, that you've mentioned. And I think our goal has always been, again, to get kids back in person with this careful review of the metrics. And I feel like this very thorough plan does support that end goal. Um, towards starting off with primarily outdoor sports under a lot of um, guidance and policy and parameters that have, are pretty thorough um, in terms of uh, how each sport is unique. So when it comes to clubs and other extracurricular activities, I'm absolutely supportive of that as well. But I think it does, it, it, as Annie framed, they're going to need the same kind of guidelines and um, just review to ensure that they are adhering to uh, the same principles that you, you've got laid out in your plan, um, Eric. Yeah. I have a couple thoughts, questions, I don't know, and I apologize if this was somewhere and I read it and I forget because I feel like there's just so much information lately and I'm having a hard time keeping track of it all. Um, so just to be clear so that everybody in the public understands too, um, this is just for the fall sports that are outdoors and school committee will be revisiting this again for other sports as they come up in other seasons. Um, um, no, right. this is for, I thought this was for participating in sports. That's what Period. I mean. And so once we participate, then say basketball comes up in the winter. They're going to have their own guidelines coming out, I'm assuming, from MIAA with a risk associated with them. 
Yeah, it's going to be, they're going to do a total review of what indoor sports would look like at that time, what individual modifications it's they to for every single sport. Yeah, just as they did for the fall sports, they would do an extensive review of the current situation, as well as what do individual sports need if they were to be played indoors? What are all the modifications and guidelines that need to be in place for them to even entertain um, interscholastic events um, of that nature? So if we opt in, we opt in for everything and then just follow MIAA guidance. I'm cor that's correct? Okay. Um, the other thing, and I, I apologize again if this was brought up, I'm just thinking about our cohorts, right? So I'm thinking about if we go back to school and school committee every two weeks is reviewing um, school transmission data and say something comes up, something pops up along the way and we've got a cohort, a particular class that needs to um, isolate for 14 days. Um, I'm making the assumption at that point that it would be the same that applies to school. They either get tested so that they can continue to participate or they quarantine themselves. So I can help with that too, Eric. Right. So you're at, did I do the talk? So the students, whether they're in an extracurricular activity or they're in an academic activity, then those protocols for suspected or confirmed case are exactly the same. So you're right, there's a positive case or a suspected positive case. We go through whichever protocol applies to that situation. Um, yeah, if there were a student who was, uh, uh, if a student athlete became infected with COVID-19, then their in-person cohort, at, that, that becomes a close contact. So that cohort that they sit with academically is a close contact. And most likely their fellow athletes in their athletic cohort are close contacts. Um, every other person in those two cohorts does not then become a close contact of other people, right? Remember exposed to exposed is not a close contact. Uh, it's exposed to known, right? That, that's the close contact. And then the only other thought that I had that I just, it, it gets so complicated, right? When you start thinking about all these different groups of people, um, would we just simply be following MIA guidance. So we're going to, later we're going to be talking about metrics for the school and hopefully that this is a completely moot point and we don't have to get to this point, but let's hypothetically say that um, case counts go up and our numbers go up and we get to a point based on, you know, whatever we look at for um, metrics that we need to go fully remote. Yeah, I hope we don't get to that point. You know, what, what do we do then when it comes to sports, do we still do we still just follow guidance MIA? Would we go? Would sports stop? What what would happen? I don't know. Do you know? I would what I mean? say because the school committee has the authority. The school committee is tasked with the authority to determine whether or not to participate. But the school committee opted to revoke that authority because they had a health concern about the schools. That um, you could deliberate about that and then similarly uh, decide that you wanted to do something different. Can I build on this question and ask it, it? To me, I'm thinking about it like a snow day. Any one day you realize uh, COVID is spreading and, there, and there's known information that tells you that it's um, spreading through students in schools. Um, if the school goes remote due to, for that reason, wouldn't sports autom also automatically go remote? For, I mean, in other words, the sports would just not happen during that time. Is that not the case? Well, I would say that if there were, if we had any concern, that the same kind of concerns that would drive us to say, we need to uh, stop in-person learning altogether for a period of time, then you're right, Humera, if, if the school committee delegated that authority to me, I would say I would apply that same authority to sports, right? So I, I should have been clear, I'm not implying, I don't think just like in a regular season that um, the school committee has, uh, the school committee has policies about participation in sports. For example, a student has to be, uh, if school is canceled, um, then for the most part, we don't play unless there's some, if, if 
unless the only reason that we canceled was because um, we couldn't get, we had to, like after it, we couldn't do with a two hour delay. So for the most part, if we're canceled, we don't then play in the evening. So we adhere to policies. If there's an exception made to school committee policy, I would get school committee approval. In this case, I'm not looking saying the school committee is going to decide at every single moment, but in general, if the school committee decided, you know, we want a complete change to our policy about whether or not we're going to participate in, we're going, to, we want extracurriculars to continue, we want athletics to continue. I'm saying I believe the school committee would have the authority to also say, we want to bring this agenda item up and we want to vote differently. But you could certainly, um, you could certainly say that um, in terms of delegating that authority to the superintendent, once you've opted to participate, you could delegate the authority um, to me to determine whether or not uh, we continue with that. We will be meeting every single two weeks to look at metrics. And as part of that conversation, um, I think if we're doing something, whether we're progressing to another phase or we have some sort of concern, we think we need to maintain or we need to do something different, it wouldn't just be about academics, it would be about all programming extracurriculars as well. That makes sense to me. Tamara, that's a great question too, as to how that interacts with our future discussions. Yeah, I I think that sounds logical to me. And um, just, I have not said anything about the clubs, but I totally believe in equity along across the board. Um, and I would want to, you know, there is no MIAA that is governing school clubs, but I would expect that um, there is a thorough plan that the school is putting in place in terms of um, oversight of the clubs and oversight of the students' um, activities or engagement, adult supervision to ensure mask um, wearing is taking place, that students are socially distanced, et cetera. I, I, have, I don't think I've seen that come to fruition yet, probably because we haven't talked about it yet, but I imagine that that would be the very next thing once we um, allow for something like that to happen. I can add to that too. So we do have DEFI's guidance and I'm working with teachers on developing those plans. For right now too, primarily when I say club, uh, for in-person, I mean more the club that would significantly benefit from that. So jazz band, drama, um, things of that nature that also have specific outdoor guidance. So in the guidance, it suggests that they are outside and how far apart they are. Um, for other things uh, like newspaper or something, I'm not advocating that they're meeting in person in new cohorts at this time. Um, but I also, uh, as we get those plans, if that's something that I need to bring to school committee, I can do so, but I am gathering them now. So anyone who plans on advising anything was told that that wouldn't be happening until they presented a plan, even if we weren't talking about in person. So they all had to have plans going forward for this year. And that, that seems in line, April, with kind of this start with very mm -hmm. limited use of indoor facility. Yeah. Yeah. And we also recognize, to, to April's point, we also recognize that we don't want to create the possibility for transmission if it's not necessary. So she provided a great example. Newspaper is something you can do remotely. Um, jazz band is a, a qualitatively different experience, right, when you're doing it individually and remotely. Soccer does not feel the same remotely. So if we can uh, derive the benefit and almost a, a pretty close enjoyment, we're not going to say, we're not going to encourage increased transmission. Every time a human being moves, they're uh, potential, potentially a virus taxi. So if we don't need to encourage it, we won't. Um, and she would be judicious in recommending which clubs would, but the teachers, the advisors do have to have plans um, that reflect SE guidance and our district reopening plan if they would like to propose any sort of in-person meeting that would have to be approved. Great. By the way, I hear that there's quite a bit of transmission of aerosol that mm -hmm. takes place in the playing of um, saxophone and other uh, instruments like that, having two saxophone players in the family. I, I, I've i learned this, I've been schooled on this. So um, I, I know that the, the team will do the right thing when it comes to studying what the experts are recommending and making sure that our um, athletes, our musicians, our students are safe. 
Mm -hmm. Eric, can I ask you one more question about the, 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 the club sports, like the kids going to play club sports um, sure. on the weekends, that potential? It, yeah. Do you see that as an issue at all in Hadley? Is that something that we, we could potentially run into? Um, as an issue, I mean, there's a strong possibility that student athletes will continue to play on outside of sports teams. I'm not going to – I won't beat around the bush about that. Um, yeah. we, we have – for such a small school, we have a really strong set of student athletes. Uh, our sports programs compete with schools that are much larger than us. And it speaks to the dedication and level uh, that our student athletes apply to their craft. Um, so they're not just playing at school. They do some excellent things while they're here and they impress us every day, but it's not simply based off what they're doing here. Um, some of the students are, are very intent on bettering themselves and that, and that involves playing on schools, um, sports outside of school. I don't think it's like, I don't think it's anything out of the normal that any other school is looking at. Um, any school that's opening this opportunity up to their student athletes would have the same, is going to look at the same issue. Um, their athletes are going to be trying to strive themselves, especially sports individ individualization as, uh, as it's going um, in this kind of day and age. Um, mm -hmm. Student athletes are trying to make their best to, to get a scholarship and, and make, make a go of it. Um, so yeah, I, I wouldn't want to, you know, Lie, not lie, but I wouldn't want to like dissuade, you know, the opinion that they might be doing something not, but they might not be doing something outside of school. Uh, truthfully, yes, there's, there's a high probability they are, but okay. it would be, it would be limited. So if we're providing an opportunity, we are limiting the amount of time and ability for them to seek or the need for them to seek an outside of school. So it would, it would reduce certainly the number of student athletes that would play on outside of school. Cause a lot of students don't have time or it's an extremely like high level of commitment to playing multiple sports teams in one season. So. Thanks. Yeah, you're welcome. Any other questions around this? Not a question, but a comment. It's going to come up later when we talk about uh, testing, and we're not there yet. But um, when we have widespread, you know, one dollar per, you know, stick of testing um, capability that any individual can, you know, test once every three days, this this almost becomes almost becomes a moot point because we can so quickly pinpoint and tell in advance uh, whether something is coming. And so I just, just a heads up that um, we have to do these things in parallel because even if we do put a toe in the water and try to have safe sports, um, we can mitigate any risks of doing so if we in parallel um, take a very responsible and assertive role in um, expanding tests that our students um, and, and maybe even our students and families have access to. Yeah, and I think, I mean, obviously that interacts uh, very well with our ability to look at metrics moving forward once we are able to have more readily available, cheaper uh, and quick turnaround uh, testing, I agree. Okay, is, um, is there any further question, dialogue, debate around this topic? We do need to take action. And um, so there would need to be a motion uh, to, to approve uh, participation in um, athletics and extracurricular activities under guidance um, of the corresponding you know, governing body. <laughs> So moved. Is there a second? Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Abstain. Okay. Great. Thank you. And thank you, thank Eric, you, Eric. Um, thank for you. the thoroughness with this. And we look forward to continuing to dialogue with you over the fall. It'll be good to hear how everything is going. No, thank you very much for the opportunity to discuss this with the school committee tonight. And uh, we're going to do everything in our power to make sure our students are safe, healthy, getting their exercise. And uh, so I'll, I'll continue to update as things move along and send information out in a, as timely a fashion as I can. And 
as concrete decisions are made because every school is going through the same thing. So as, as more decisions are made, all the better idea of what we're looking at as far as um, any sort of competitions or schools we might play or how the landscape will, will pan out. So thank you very much. Thanks. All right, if we're gonna to move to the next topic uh, we have on the list, which is the Hopkins Academy Handbook, which will be presented by April Camuso. Thanks, I feel like this is a little less exciting, but I'll, I'll try and be both specific and quick. I have a couple of exciting handbooks to, to share tonight. Um, so I'm gonna screen share just in case it's helpful, but I know that you have the, uh, both the handbook and the summary. I'm gonna go through just a few of the, the summary bullets, the highlights for everyone. So I did have to make a, a few changes, of course, to the handbook per usual. Some of those changes were basic ones around the table of contents, matching the numbers, correcting the school year, correcting any grammatical errors or typos that were in there. And then there was a few others. So one of the other pieces that I wanna highlight is the addition of this, which is our statement of core values. This was voted in by the faculty um, in 2019. However, it did not go to the school council at the time, so that will go to the school council this fall. This came as a result of our work with um, our NEAS committees and the NEAS visit. So this uh, goes back to the work that we did under Brian, so that's in there. It just um, was missed in last year's handbook. So I made sure to insert that to update it with what we had. I also, and I'll jump down a little bit, did some work around attendance. Um, so you may or may not know that in the last couple of years, I've worked as head teacher. A part of that responsibility had to do with tardies and attendance, and I worked very closely with Brian. So we didn't change anything in terms of um, these definitions of extensive or excessive tardiness. We didn't change the numbers of tardy and how that adds up. What uh, was looked at instead was taking into consideration the philosophies of restorative justice the school has been using as a guiding principle and making sure that the consequence for a tardy aligned a little bit more with those philosophies. So previously, if a student was tardy uh, after they hit kind of their top marks or what you see for the, the six and consecutive tardies, they would have to serve an office detention, which would essentially be a detention with an assigned teacher for that day and an assigned group of children who all had detentions, which could be for a variety of reasons, would attend that office detention. Um, this is problematic for a couple of reasons. One, in the, in the current climate, uh, I'm not sure that we have much after school detention at all right right now, but, but we also certainly don't want to put together a group of children who would not otherwise be with one another. So that kind of goes along well with it there. But in terms of restorative justice, the thought is a student is tardy, they're missing a teacher's class. Instead of putting them with another teacher and just sitting there for an hour, the thought is to have them make up that time with the teacher whose class they missed instead. So having them connect with that teacher, make up that time there, Additionally, work with me around developing a punctuality plan, which is something that I had worked on, uh, Brian and I had worked on together last year as well, and then meet with the parents. So some of that was kind of already being done where students could leave an office detention to work with the teacher anyway. So it's kind of more formalizing a practice that we had already been doing within the school around that philosophy. Similarly, a few pieces in the code of conduct were also changed. I'll try to jump down to that. So again, uh, in general, in the handbook, I limited office detentions and instead put in just teacher or principal detentions. Again, thinking that detaining students with somebody where the offense was not related to that teacher didn't logically coincide with our beliefs around restorative justice. So that was changed there. Um, within that, there were a couple pieces that were just redundant. They had the sort of chapter law consequence, and then they had uh, a, a repeat of that. So those were taken out. And uh, there was one more that was added, which has to do with the additions to Title IX. If I can find the correct one, I had to add it in at the very end. Um, this one, I believe, the forgery or production of false or misleading documents was one that had to be added because of Title IX updates. So that was included as well. 
Uh, for academic integrity, there were some changes made there just to sort of update it to the 21st century. So adding some pieces about the internet and Google Translate and some other related items and getting clear about that language. That is something that is uh, specifically gone over with students in multiple classes at the beginning of the year. And then every English course that they take, they do uh, read and sign and take home, which I guess will happen virtually this year, a policy around plagiarism and academic integrity. So that was just updated to kind of include some of those more contemporary components. And then Title IX, uh, there were a lot of updates in Title IX. So those were changed in here. I can jump down. We uh, had a training on that this summer that we attended to go through those different updates. A lot of those have to do with that investigation, but also even choosing when and how to investigate and then the steps that have to be followed. Sorry, the handbook is long, so I'm just jumping ahead to the relevant section. Uh, so you can feel free to read through these closer, but it is several pages now. We have our Title IX coordinators here, but there are different pieces about what is considered, um, when it needs to be reported, how it's reported, how it's investigated, so that's all of these steps here, and all of this is taken from the, the regulations and reviewed. Um, but it is a, a bit of a different process than what we had previously. And then the next section uh, was around a past policy, which for those of you who don't know what that means, essentially when students leave a class, they're expected to have a pass with them. So again, this was changed for two reasons. One, we don't really want kids carrying around our laminated passes everywhere. That seems like an extra thing to try to clean and not get germs all over. And the other piece, um, of that is thinking about the consequences, just trying to build them up the same way we did the cell phone. So I, I did update in here the cell phone policy to match the changes that were made to the cell phone policy last year, uh, which worked really well essentially for students. It was, you don't get to use your cell phone <laughs> when you're in school and they abided by that. And then there were steps about how to handle that and when it gets taken away and when they get it back. So I matched it to the past policy because we've had a lot of violations as of late of students abusing the past policy which uh, essentially means that they said that they're going to the bathroom, they're gone for 10 minutes, they visited their friend, they went to the office to say hi to, to one of the administrative assistants and then returned. Um, so things of that nature, we, I just went through and kind of changed those steps to match. And then the last piece is that the adjust policy, which is updated here and in the program of studies so that they, they match one another. And here is updated to reflect the discussions that we've been having at the school, which is a policy where VHS um, does not replace the teachers at Hopkins, where we believe that the teachers that we have are highly qualified and that students primarily should be taking classes that we've offered. The teachers have worked uh, very diligently in terms of developing new curriculum, right? We've gained new pathways and two pathways and early college high school and all these pieces. And we don't necessarily want to just be outsourcing to VHS all of the time. Um, and instead using VHS in order to resolve significant course conflicts and where it can help us to go beyond the scope of what we can offer to thinking about it like a gifted and talented program. So it's kind of a summary. There is a lot in there and there are a few other details. Uh, you can see the track, not everyone here can, but you guys can see the track changes in that if you want to look through all of those specifics as well. But for now, do you have any questions for me about any aspect of the handbook? Um, I um, I have to admit, I did not, I, I don't know where this, it wasn't in our um, PDF packet, so it's possible that it was in an email and my school committee members got it and I, I didn't, but I haven't had a chance to read it, so I'm looking forward to reading it. Thank you for sharing it. Um, you mentioned the um, the cell phone policy. If it they're um, not following cell phone policy, the cell phone gets taken away. If they're not following the bathroom policy. Do their bathroom privileges get taken away? What happens? No, let me find that one on there specifically. It's uh, more about the the progression of it. So I, I did um, quite a bit of reading over the summer about um, racism in, um, in high schools and elementary schools. One of the interesting things I learned was how much um, implicit bias goes into um, people getting pulled over, if you will, 
mm -hmm. um, when they don't look the right, you know, don't don't look the right way, and how many white kids have fessed up to never being pulled over for not having a hall, hall, you know, bathroom pass. So it's just, um, I'm not saying that kids, you know, wouldn't veer off the pathway and say hello to their friends and take every opportunity to do that. But just, um, but what I am saying is how the consequences might be disproportionate um, or the number of times you get pulled over or called out um, and the fact that that has over time has been documented. But mm -hmm. so I'm curious about this. Yeah, well, this would come from the teacher where the pass is being violated. Um, so on a first offense, if they had in fact violated it, right, would, could, would be a teacher warning and or teacher detention, it might depend on what that violation is. I would also say, for example, that uh, a place where this can become escalated, if a student abuses their pass and is gone for 30 minutes, that can be considered as technically cutting class. And so this is a place right where you could be more lenient and say, you were gone for 30 minutes, it's obviously a, a pass violation. We're not interested in suspending you for that, which is the consequence for cutting class. We're more interested in giving you a teacher detention. And the next offense is a teacher de detention for sure. And then after that, a teacher detention and a loss of privilege for all classes per week. And then after that, principal detention and loss of privilege is determined by the principal. The thought behind the teacher detention, again, is that you have uh, violated the, the path and the trust with that teacher. So by having that student stay, or, you know, in this, in this world, this isn't maybe as important right now, or they might be meeting online instead, but having that time together that they can work on repairing that relationship and that issue as to, to what happened around that. Um, so it's not an immediate revoking of that privilege. It's, again, not quite as important this year as when I first started working on the handbook as we sort of went through our reentry planning, which could become more important as the year sort of progresses um, at, at this time maybe not quite as much. Uh, we know that we're also going to be keeping quite an eye on the hallways at the beginning to make sure that students are getting used to all of the protocols for the students that are in the building. So that's what's in there currently. Um, I did have the, the HA leadership team, the department chairs, head teacher, middle school team leader take a look at this, um, but I do welcome any, any feedback around that. Do you want me to jump up to the cell phone one too? Uh, no, that's all right. I just was curious about what happens um, when there's not non-compliance and I this makes sense to me if you're um, missing a subject that you're you know you're you might have an aversion to or an educator who you know just that circumstance is obviously not capturing your attention in the way in which we hope then you you're asking the child and the teacher to really lean in and and figure that out and exactly. they're less likely to want to do that the second time and the third time and take time away from the other things that they love doing to to make this happen so it makes sense yep. i would just add to your question about and something that ethan you mentioned at our last meeting uh, is how do we make sure that we evaluate all of our practices and priorities through a diversity, equity, and inclusion lens. So one of the ways that we can do this is we can ask a few questions with the student information management system. So throughout the course of the year, uh, Ms. Kamusa and I will remember to do this, and at any point in time, the school committee could, could ask and say, wait a minute, I don't feel like we've seen that data, but we'll add that to the school committee calendar. So if we're asking questions about disproportionality based on race, income, gender, or disability, and discipline, there are two places in school brains that we can look. So we can look at total referrals and we can look at disciplinary consequences. So we can ask questions about what is the, what, and, and given how small we are, um, we can provide actual counts because sometimes percentages get way off when you're talking teeny tiny groups of people, but the counts are still descriptive, right? Uh, so we can provide counts and the counts behind percentages, just to forewarn you if you're only talking a total in of, of five kids, then percentages start to get off. But we can still look at those counts. We can say, here's the total number of disciplinary referrals. Um, here's the total head count of all students that had disciplinary referrals. And then we can do all kinds of analysis as to the demographic breakdown of the students receiving disciplinary referrals the students receiving consequences from disciplinary referrals and see if anything is off track there. Is there any type of disproportionality, right? And we can even ask questions because to your point, Humira, well, how do we uncover if 
there's disappoint if the absence of disciplinary referrals is telling us something, is there disproportionality in the absence of other disciplinary referral? We can still do that with the data in the student information system, right? If you start asking those questions about who's getting referred, you can ask the other question, who isn't, based on demographic characteristics. So um, I think what I hear you saying, Humera, and what Ethan said last week is how do we just constantly keep our attention on this? And I'm telling you that we do have access to, we have the ability to track, to, to record that information in our student information system, to surface that data and analyze it collectively with the school committee and ask ourselves, what might this mean? And is it, is it bringing up something that needs to be addressed or analyzed further? Does that get at one of your concerns potentially, Humara? It, it does. Um, I, I think we, we're always saying we're such a small school and uh, the data can be, you know, an, an outlier and not really indicative of a larger pattern. But, uh, but generally the students know when there's unequal treatment, whether uh, it's a person of color or, or, uh, or if it's um, someone who's not someone who is from a more privileged, privileged position. And I, I would like us, I know we do regular um, surveys and interactions with our students. I'd like us to um, understand the ways in which we can use those mechanisms to surface um, uh, realities that we may not be paying attention to um, because I think that we just have to um, approach it from multiple different perspectives. Mm -hmm. and, and are there patterns? Are there, are there patterns uh, in um, uh, how, how this uh, emerges that we should be mindful of? Yeah. I, 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 <laughs> I was just going to say, we are going to be looking at uh, over the summer and, and one of our, our side pieces I was trying to set up for regular behaviors in the school year besides reentry. We have been pulling our data around courses and enrollment and discipline to review with the faculty at one of our first faculty meetings um, so we can get some of those conversations started to say, you know, what do we see in this data and what might it be telling us um, and how does it also kind of fit in with our values or not. But I think you're right, you know, approaching it with some different methods, um, the work that I've done in the school around gender equity, we had some different avenues where we got information back from students. Uh, and they were able to share some of their, their views around that. And some of the work I've done um, in research with some students as well, which was kept confidential, where I did qualitative research with some students around their experiences around this topic, do also reflect some of the things that you're saying. So I'm definitely open and, and happy to take suggestions around any of that. And I would say, wow, we just had a mind meld there, April. I was going to say in the next, when you think about the program of studies, you'll have to approve this first, but in the program of studies, those, those questions, the two really big questions are always who's present and who's absent and what does it mean, right? And in either set, whether it's a positive experience, who's present in the positive experience, who's avoiding the negative experience. And the same is true, of course, enrollment data, right? So when we look at the program of studies, who's present, who's present in higher level courses, what do they look like, who are they, who isn't? And what is that telling us, right? And I know we're not, we're looking at the Hopkins Academy School Handbook, but I'm also um, excited to um, cross this bridge with the Hadley Elementary School Handbook as well. Next school committee meeting. We didn't want to put all the excitement in one night. We like to spread it out for you all. Oh, you're keeping me in suspense. We like to pace ourselves. <laughs> and Humera, you should have access to a folder that, um, April had shared with us. I believe it's called August 2020. Okay. Yes. And, it, came, it came a while ago, didn't it? Yeah. And okay. it has it has the handbook. It has the program of studies in there. It that also is, has the school council information that we're going to be discussing as really well beautiful. as the remote learning student survey. Okay, great. Thank you. You're welcome. Any other questions about the handbook for now? No. I know it's long. <laughs> okay, so um, 
with the handbook, we do need to um, uh, take action on that. So we would need a motion to approve um, the Hopkins Academy Student Handbook for 2020 to 2021. Is there a motion? So moved. A second? Seconded. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstain? Okay, thank you. That is approved. Thank you, April. No problem. Um, so next we have the program of studies, Hopkins Academy uh, uh, presentation, and that is also something that we need to um, take action on. I think. Great. Thanks. Uh, so this had the, the summary with it as well. This one's a little bit simpler. The program of studies will have a full review just in a couple months in the fall with all of the teachers and the leadership team. Uh, I just went through and had to make a, a few basic kind of corrections. So there were some course codes that maybe didn't line up appropriately with what we were using in school brain, uh, or there were some missing for some newer courses. Um, organizationally, I had to move a couple courses around to put them into the appropriate section. So some of that had to be done. Uh, I did change, I did make one larger change to the GPA weighting, and this will end up being a larger discussion in terms of the electives. Uh, in each core, each core has a set of electives. So history has an elective, philosophy, mythology, math has introduction to engineering uh, and the logical reasoning, science has a few, English has a few, creative writing, film studies, all of those. For some reason, all of the English electives were listed as elective O2, which means that they were not counting in a student's GPA, but all of the electives in every other core area were college prep O2, which means they were counting in a student's GPA. So for now, I changed all of those English electives, although I'm not sure that any of them are actually being offered this year. We are down, down in English teacher, but I changed them all so that they would match the other core electives and be counted in a student's GPA. The larger discussion that will happen later is that none of the other electives are counted in the student's GPA, so PE, band, chorus, art, none of those get counted in the GPA. Um, so that's a discussion for another time, but I didn't want to unilaterally get into that this summer by myself. Um, I just kind of made the other one align with the other cores. I did also make a slight change to the independent studies and TAs. I didn't change the description or the protocol, but previously it did not have its own course number. So we have a, a separate course number for work study. And so similarly, I created a course number for independent studies and teaching assistance. And then the way that those will get differentiated will just be by a section. So it'll be independent study as a course, and then there'll be a section with the teacher under it. It's a little bit more an organiz organizational thing so that we don't have 100 independent study courses in school brains. It kind of keeps it more centered in one place and every independent study has the same course number. As I said before, I updated the VHS pieces and just made them match in both. So it'd be exactly the same as in the handbook that's in there as well. I added uh, two new courses. So we have Human Evolution and Technology as a new elective. And we also have World History One, which is sort of a new course, sort of not. The, the history standards changed, and so they're changing when courses are being offered over time. And so that's kind of just the new one that folds into ninth grade now. And that was missing. So I put that into the program of studies. And then at the very end, I inserted some write-ups about early college high school and innovation pathways. Those were both um, approved after the initial program of studies. So for right now, it was primarily just sort of sorting out some um, minor errors and then further discussions about the program of studies and classes to be offered in the following school year will be a discussion for the fall. Do you guys have any questions about that? I I mean, that seemed very straightforward uh, to me, and I appreciated the, the chart that you had of the summary of changes. Yeah, this one was an ad. There's more that could be done later, but uh, that involves a lot more discussions among teachers and yourself. Any questions from the committee? No. Is there a motion then to approve the um, Program of Studies for Hopkins Academy 2020 to 2021. So moved. Second. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed or abstain? Okay. 
Approved. And let's see, now we're moving to the school council process, which we also will need to um, have an action item around that as well. Go ahead, April. Thanks. Uh, so um, as you know, this is my first year with school council. So I'm just in the process of setting that up. And so I just wanted to share through my process um, using a representative election process for the members of the school council. And so I needed that to be approved by you all. Um, so I'm here with that now. It's looking at two parent representatives, two teacher representatives, one community member representative, two students um, who do have to be nine through 12. And then that would be done through nominations and elections to be done in the month of September. Um, so as soon as, as this hopefully gets approved, we'll be starting those different processes. For the student one, for example, is gonna use their student council to develop that and have a nomination and election process. I will run the parent one, uh, the teachers are going to run that one. Rebantis Gibbons has volunteered to help run that one. And the community member one, I will also run. So a question I had on this document, and it was more around um, if somebody's status changes, like if a student representative who's in the 12th grade um, beginning a two-year term uh, graduates, or if a... Um, community member representative becomes a, a teacher or, you know, people switch in terms of their roles. How, how do you address that in terms of, um, you mentioned a special election if they can't serve within that two years, but is there any other shifting around? How does that work? Uh, I mean, my, I guess, idea or vision was just that we would hold the special election. So the same way we went through the process the first time, at that time, we would just have those same groups go through the nomination and election process again for whoever is replacing them. Got it. So if there's like a 12th grade student on a two-year term and they become then a community member um, per se and they're interested in participating, they would have to rerun as a community member? I hadn't thought about that. I see what you're saying now. Um, I'm not sure if this is a great technical answer, but I, <laughs> I wouldn't be opposed to them just staying on, but I do see how that would shift the dynamic. So no, I guess they couldn't do that because then that would end up disrupting the number and the participants. Yeah, that, that's the only thing I just wasn't clear on is because there's there may be other people representing from a perspective that then become a different role in the in the the public schools. And, and that's all. It, it was just more clarification around how that works. No, Maybe that's helpful. And I could add language about that to clarify because they would it would throw it out of balance uh, and you don't ever want your committee to be too big or have, as you're saying, like the voices of the representation shift. So I can add some language to about how the shifting of roles, they would have to wait until the next opportunity to run in that newer role. In that newer role. Okay. That, that makes sense. And I think initially I was thinking more from, you know, if there were a parent representative that then became a teacher representative, you know, it, it, I'm sorry, became a teacher and they wanted to serve in that role, they'd have to wait until they could then be part of the, the um, council serving in that role. And until then, they'd be a parent representative, right? Yeah. Like that okay. student, you're recruiting ninth and 10th graders, really, um, because, oh, or, and, you know, not, I guess 11th grade would be the last year. Would you consider their full 11th and 12th grade year? Well, yeah, probably, you could still have someone as a senior, they would just only end up serving a year and then you would do another student special election for the following year. Yeah. Other than that, I had no questions. It was more just um, roles and terms and that. No, and that's important because in our, in our small community that can happen, so. Yeah. Yeah, that is, that is an important one. I would, I guess, I would urge us to think about, um, you know, it's especially if you're younger and um, you're still acquiring knowledge about how these things work. You need, you almost need two years to hit your stride and, and really make a, a difference. So if it's a revolving door um, of seniors, for instance, are you? Are you really going to have a two-year role? Maybe, maybe that's then explicitly one year if that's the intention. It's just something to consider. Um, it's the advantage of having a length of time to really make a difference. Mm -hmm. Good point. 
Are any other questions on the um, <laughs> council membership profile or sorry, um, process? If we um, vote this policy in, it applies only to Hopkins Academy, not to Hadley Elementary School. Right. And the reason you have at Hadley Elementary School, um, so this representative process, what the school committee has typically done at Hadley Elementary School in the past is that there have been volunteers. They mind, they're mindful of what that balance is. They also have a representative parent organization. Um, and although I want to be careful, the PTO does rep represent both schools. There's a larger percentage of parents, I believe, in the PTO that come from the elementary school. So in the absence of a representative parent organization, the process that April has just laid out is um, something that we're almost required to do. Uh, at Hadley Elementary, we have historically requested volunteers to create that balance. Like we've gone out and encouraged people to be a part of it from various groups. Um, and we had, um, thankfully, always gotten people to volunteer um, to participate. We encourage anybody to reach out to the principal who's interested in serving on the school council. And we talked about this a lot over the summer, tried to encourage parents who were interested in having a voice in the schools to please reach out to the principal. There are open meetings too. So anyone can yeah. come and forget. Yeah, I was well, just gonna know. say that April, they are open meetings and we encourage people to attend as often as possible. We at Hadley Elementary School have a dedicated um, committee that we've had set teachers and a, a committee um, and volunteers rather. Um, we lost one parent who will be going to Hopkins who's interested in, in getting onto the Hopkins committee, which I think will be very valuable. And April and I have discussed having joint um, school committee, um, school council meetings rather, um, to kind of align some of our future goals. So I'm excited by the opportunity to, to work with both councils. Great. Any other questions around the school council membership process for Hopkins Academy? And is there a motion to approve? So moved. Seconded. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed or abstain? Okay, that is approved. Let's see, April, you have one more item on here, the <laughs> Hopkins Academy Student Survey Remote Learning Results. I do, thank you. So this is the survey that Bobby Clush developed and I sent out to the students in order to get some feedback from all the students seven through 12 about their remote learning experience in the spring. So that could be shared uh, with the students and with the faculty and with yourselves um, in order to provide some information one of the things too, um, and this isn't formally being used in teacher evaluation, but one of our processes in teacher evaluation is to use student feedback. So this can be kind of another form of the regular process that students do. I thought we had a pretty good response rate, uh, especially considering uh, sometimes other emails that maybe students aren't as interested in. They were sort of very quickly responding to the survey questions. So that's good. And we had 142 respondents and I gave you the chart here that shows you the grade level, how many students and the percentage who did respond to this. Overall, I know that you have- uh, April, let me ask you, do you wanna share your screen and show this at all? We're still seeing that um, student handbook. Oh, that's weird. Oh, I switched over last time too. I said I'm still screen sharing. Yeah, we're- uh, But you're sharing the past policy. No, oh, well, I changed it on my computer. Let me try resharing. Re that means you didn't see when I artfully shared the program of studies either, but there wasn't much to look at, so that's okay. Yeah. You know? Here we go. Yeah. Yep. Thank you. Yeah, no problem. Um, so anyway, so I, I went through and I sort of summarized all of this together. This was shared with faculty as well at our first faculty meeting. And then I used for the first time the breakout rooms in order to have them discuss the data and talk about what they saw and what they thought it meant. And so that was really helpful. I thought they had some good ideas around that. A couple of things that I will say about this, you'll notice that only um, a very small percentage of our students have taken online classes before. 70.8% of students 
have never taken an online class at all. I think considering that, their feedback was actually pretty positive. In the survey of those who responded, only 20.8% did not enjoy their experience. And 52.8% felt like they learned an average amount or more. You might feel like that's not very high, but something to keep in mind that I, I do know sometimes gets forgotten is that teachers were only allowed to provide about two hours of instruction for a class in a week. And that included class instruction and homework. And so if you think about a usual week, in a, in a regular week, you are looking at four and a half hours of just in-class instruction, not including homework for a student. So they were, they were given much less curriculum uh, by order of the state around that and still felt like they learned pretty much what they would have learned anyway. So to me, that's, that's a definitely positive um, view around that. And I would say in comparison to the faculty, because they did survey the faculty as well, the faculty felt much worse. They felt like students did not learn anything. Uh, so it's nice to see that the students did not feel the same. Although I would say faculty are generally harder on themselves around that, even, even in a good end of the year. So expectations are always really high around that. Uh, in terms of the pieces that faculty talked about, so when they looked at these different answers, I provided with them with exactly what you're seeing here. The part they focused on the most is this sort of contrast between students wanting flexibility and students wanting structure, us also knowing that students are going to be given structure, and then how that might play out this year. So there were some conversations around how students might feel and about how to continue to strike a balance between those two things, how to provide them that structure, but also provide them a bit of flexibility when possible and what that might look like. Um, these are kind of the bigger takeaways. I don't know if there's how many thoughts or comments that you want to share on this. I just wanted to share the feedback as we had discussed. And I did share this with Bobby as soon as I, uh, it closed out and I got the data together. I thought it was interesting that, um, you know, about half dislike not being able to see their teachers face to face. Mm -hmm. I couldn't tell if that was I missed seeing them in person versus I missed seeing them on a video. Um, so it'll be interesting to see with, you know, being able perhaps with, you know, the fall, having more of that FaceTime, even though it may be remote, um, how much that that is hopefully better received. And this did include the seventh graders here were actually the sixth graders last year. So even though those were students at HES, since they're students that are going to be in our building this year, I wanted to make sure to include them in the survey for their experience as well. That's excellent. Thank you for doing this and kudos to Bobby for pulling together such a great um, student comprehensive view of um, what their views are about online learning. Yeah, I thought it was very helpful. I thought, you know, some of it was kind of what you would expect. They liked sleeping and they liked being at home. But even places where they said they missed that time with their teachers, uh, it's also nice because there's some days you feel like you're the last person they might want to see. I think just like parents feel sometimes. So it's nice, you know, when you know that they, they do still want that and they do still want the structure um, and need that. So I think it, you know, we're headed in a positive direction this fall. Yeah. yeah, thanks. Yeah. And thanks, thanks, Bobby, for putting it together. You know, I, I keep wondering too, how do we, what does post COVID look like? Um, you know, what are these lessons of things that people like? And, um, you know, the independent learning or the, the, the flexibility, I think that was the highest one, the 88%. Of, mm -hmm. And I think for my boys, that means more sleep. So I think about our, you know, discussion about delaying start times in some regard. So, Interesting lessons. Yeah, flexible working conditions and also um, being able to see instructions written on, on online, um, just accessibility um, enhancements that come with online education that we just, you know, when we when we see those benefits, it'll be hard to unsee. It'll be hard to undo, I, I hope. Um, the, you know, the best, the best uh, elements of this we'll be able to retain. Um, quick question, and perhaps you mentioned this. Um, when was this survey executed? Uh, gosh, I don't know if I remember the date. Started ended on August 25th. 
Okay. And I think we had it out for a week or two. Is Bobby still around? Is he still in here? He might remember. <laughs> it was about a week or two. So it was after after you guys had voted on the, the re-entry plan. Um, yeah, he, he is he is in attendance if he wants to go off mute and give information about when it went out. But that's up to him. It, it's okay if he doesn't want to. <laughs> it was out for, I want to say, about oh, a week. Hey, Bobby. Hello. Hi. Hi. So, yes, we, um, the survey, let me, um, so we sent the survey out on August 11th. Um, and then I sent a reminder to the students on August 18th, just saying we're halfway through the period for when the survey is going to be active. You have a week left to submit your response. Um, I encourage you to do so. It lets you have your feedback be heard. Um, so it can kind of shape how this experience is going to turn out. And then August 25th, a week later is when all the, um, responses were closed to the survey. So at that point, uh, Ms. Camuso could go ahead and take inventory of all the responses that there were and then put the document together to be sent out to students and school committee and the parents. Great. Mostly I was wondering, you know, the spring was tough on everyone. And um, if we took a pulse of what they were feeling about online education, then it would it would have been helpful. But not nearly as helpful with the summer reflection built in for them to really take stock of how um, how it went for them personally, what they appreciated about it and what they what they didn't. So um, so thank you for reaching them during the summertime, which is hard, uh, in knowing that you were able to get even this level of response rate uh, during the summer when school is not in session uh, is pretty good. Thank you. Yeah, and I mean, I was um, I was happy to see the response rate because it seemed like a lot of the students I at least spoke with outside of the survey email were looking to have like the best experience possible. And kind of the vibes I got from everyone is that the spring was thrown together very quickly. We have all this time to plan for the fall, so it's probably not going to be exactly the same as it was in the spring. It's most likely going to be better, and they acknowledge like this is our chance to kind of say – this is how we would like to see it. And maybe we can give our feedback and have a more enjoyable experience in the fall. Um, that's kind of what I heard from other students. And you know, I was happy to see all the participation and see like people really care about it because it's our learning experience pretty much and just everything that can be as easy as possible for us and the teachers. And we're enthusiastic about getting that all sorted out. That's terrific. I would just, um, you're such a great leader, Bobby, in this community of um, Hopkins and, and uh, students, middle school and, and uh, high school. And, and uh, you know, to the extent that we can continue encouraging um, this kind of feedback sharing while school is in session directly to educators and that educators um, can keep an open mind. And I'm sure they already do this, but this kind of ongoing co-designing of what's working and not working is really essential to optimizing in real time. And, um, and students, your peers, you and your peers can really shape um, the outcomes that, uh, that we experience in this remote fashion, as well as in the cohort fashion. So um, thank you for taking a leadership role in um, encouraging that. Well, thank you. I mean, I, I enjoyed doing it because it's it's going to be my last year here and I want it to be as enjoyable for me and everyone else here. And I guess just one last thing for me, um, we're going to be starting the first few weeks. I'm not quite sure how it's going to turn out, but I'm going to try and encourage my friends to be giving feedback on how their classes are going. And I guess other teachers that are on here to try and converse with students about how they're enjoying it and kind of adapt to if there are needs that arise or things people really like, maybe kind of capitalize on those. Or if there are things people aren't lo liking, trying to figure out what we can do to make it more enjoyable or what can work. And um, just encouraging, like giving feedback, like you said, as we start these first few weeks, um, just to gauge what's working well. So it works out for everyone and it's easier on the teachers and the parents and the students. That's terrific, thank you. 
Yeah, thanks, Bobby. And uh, it's great seeing the results of this. Um, I like that last question about what would be the perfect online learning experience for you just to tap into, okay, what if you were designing it, what would it look like? And just to see those snippets from um, the students is very helpful. You know, being able to work with friends, um, have a structure, you know, some of the some of the things I read in there were really interesting. So thank you. Great. So yeah, we hope to hear more about this throughout the, the year. This is not an action item for tonight, but we really do appreciate the framing of it, um, April and Bobby, for the information moving forward. And uh, as you guys start in a couple weeks. Okay. Great. Okay. Thanks, April, again for that. Um, we're now going to move into the review of public health data and metrics. Um, we've got enclosures for that. So Tara and Annie are in the lead on this discussion um, based on uh, building off of our last conversation, as well as subsequent conversations um, you were able to have with uh, Board of Health. I will just say, uh, I wanna thank the Brewer household for the tremendous work that they did on this. Thank you so much to Tara. Thank you to Jonah for helping us out. And if it's okay, Tara, I think I made you co-host so you can screen share anything. I can also pull up slides if that's easy, but it looks like my gift to the public tonight is I'm not presenting anything. So go right ahead. <laughs> All right, I've never um, screen shared I that. Zoom. I can um, take care of that. I have, I have the slides up. So I can do you, don't, you don't mind? Okay. Not at all. And let me do slides now. Got it. Here we go. Oops. Well, how about, how about not? Can we see it? Yeah, that'd be nice if I was on the right. Why for her? Is it too, is it too big for everyone to see it all? Is there a way to make it small? Hold on. Let me just get there. I was just seeing one slide at a time there, uh, Tara. Yeah, well done. Yeah, I think we just need to go to the first slide. Yeah, there, there you we go. go. Okay. Okay. Um, so Annie and I last week met with um, a member of the Board of Health and um, brought about kind of our original concern of, um, are we going to be able to get um, enough information from the town information to make an informed decision um, about whether or not we would need to move to another phase or close a school or whatnot. Um, and that conversation did sort of transpire and just looking at um, metrics in general and figuring out what might be the most effective um, uh, metrics available to us based on what the state is providing us. So, um, and I will um, disclose, as Annie said, my husband did help put together the slides as well um, and was kind of pulled into the conversation just in general um, for his expertise with numbers and statistics and whatnot. Um, so in that conversation that we had with the Board of Health, we started kind of talking about, um, you know, what the state provided us for guidance, um, how it was relevant to our town, and then what we really wanted to look at um, to give us the most meaningful information to make the most informed um, decision to move between phases um, for our district. So two things that we looked at, are these slides just indicate the two recommendations, if you will, that we looked at, um, is risk indicator one. So there's two um, things that we'd like to look at for metrics. And the first one would be case count. Um, and it would be cases, new cases in the county. Um, and that's given to us per 100,000. And so two primarily re two primary reasons on here why to use that. Um, one is for the regional overlap. So making sure that we're not just looking at Hadley, but surrounding towns. And as that conversation kind of transpired, it kind of talked um, a little bit about colleges and what meaningful information we can get from the colleges and how accurate is it going to be. Um, at the last meeting, somebody had brought up the concern, you know, if um, 
students don't change their address over to a local address. We're not capturing that data. And um, that conversation kind of transpired into, well, we still might not be able to, because when you start to look at, it gets more complicated. When you start to look at a temporary address versus a permanent address. So if kids, for instance, at the college, say UMass, change their address over as a temporary address, we're still not capturing that data, um, even if we'd want to. So looking more regionally and looking at the county um, gives us a better idea of what's going on in the towns around us. Um, it also allows us to see, we do have a lot of influx into Hadley as far as, um, you know, surrounding towns coming into Hadley for shopping on our Route 9 corridor and whatnot. So that's one of the reasons. Um, the second is to um, establish a statistically significant population met level um, to interpret our results and trends accurately. And that, again, um, is because of our population size in Hadley, right around 5,000, maybe a little bit less. I don't know exactly what it is right now. I know the most recent data I could find was from our 2018, I think, um, town report. Um, and so that's for a couple of reasons. All of our recommendations that are being provided to us are given um, per 100,000. So we're not going to be able to get an accurate number for Hadley um, um, unless we extrapolate it to 100,000. Um, and get meaningful data, we need to include a large enough um, population to make sure that we're not getting like um, big sways in data by small numbers being counted. Um, so that's the first one. Um, we can easily look at this, um, sorry, just to add on, we can easily look at it through the DPH website. So after we go through the slides, um, I'll ask Annie to pull up the DPH website so you can just see how easy it is to navigate and how people can look at that number on a daily and or weekly basis. Um, so then also before you switch, um, what we had kind of talked about and what I had brought up before and I think I had emailed out was really looking at, again, the um, Harvard Global Health Institute's um, recommendations, which when we started really looking at them, they don't differ greatly from the state map in regards to their zone colors. Um, but this just lays it out really nicely when you look at, at, at colors. So, for instance, um, the green risk level is less than one case per 100,000. Um, yellow is one to nine cases per 100,000, orange is 10 to 24, and then um, red is over 25. And then it gives you general guidelines on where they think that um, uh, a population or community should react and where they should fall in. So that's just the general case count. So the second indicator, um, oh, sorry, I forgot this was on here. So calculating out case count. So um, when we look at this, um, the state actually provides um, case count in terms of the county on a daily basis. So we can go onto the DPH website and see um, case count, again, new cases on a daily basis for the county, and then for the town on a weekly basis in their weekly report that comes out every Wednesday. Um, so this example that was done um, was based on the weekly report for um, August 26th, so the data from August 26th, um, calculating out for the Hampshire County. Um, the case count was um, 64 cases um, in Hampshire County. So when you calculate that out to get it into the zone to get your um, rate, so 64, no, I'm sorry. So Annie's pulling up the, um, the county information from last week. So if you go through it, if you pull up that report, it goes through all the town information first. And then at the end of the town information, it pulls up the county information. And so again, this is from last week. We won't have updated um, information in terms of their weekly report until Wednesday this week. So then if you um, kind of go across and you look at their case count for Hampshire County, the number is 64. That's new cases in the last 14 days in Hampshire County. If you, um, yeah, if you go back here and you divide that by 14 days, okay, so that's because how they report their data, divide that number by 14 days and then divide it by 160,000, that's the um, population in the uh, Hampshire County. 
And then you multiply that number by 100,000 in order to extrapolate that information to be relevant um, to the guidance that's provided. And it gives you a case rate. So that case rate is 2.857, right? So then you go and you look at your little color-coded um, chart and you find out where you are based on that um, 2.857. And that falls in the yellow zone, which is one to nine cases per 100,000 people. So then this other little chart that's on here, my husband did this, um, he broke it down to give us a little bit of an idea in the county where our thresholds would be rather than having to calculate it out each time. So then less than 22 cases, and that would be per 100,000 in 14 days would leave us in the green zone. In the yellow zone, we'd be anywhere between 22 and 223 cases, orange 224 to 538, and so on in the red. So those so are the points. Those are the points at which um, the number of cases and the percent, the case uh, percentage, basically shift you into a different band. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, gotcha. yeah. So Tara, basically, th those numbers are. So basically, can you normalize it for the one hundred sixty thousand for the population? So this this. I'm not sure I understand what you mean. So it is it is doing that. So that's the 160, but the the guidance that's provided is for 100,000. So then you want to convert that data to get an actual number of cases per 100,000, which is also how the state reports it too, in terms of per 100,000. So you want to convert it into that number in order to get relevant a relevant number for the county at 160,000 um, uh, people, roughly. Um, into 100,000, what would that number be per 100,000? Yeah, and I would say it, to that, Paul, so that's exactly, exactly what you said, Tara, and exactly, so if you go back and you say less than one is green, right, and you say 22 and you divide it by 14 and you divide it by 1.6, which is the same as times it by 160,000, or, you know, or dividing by 160 and times it by 100,000. So if you took 22 divided by 14 divided by 1.6, it's less than one. Right. why Jonah says there's your easy breakdown and, and that's for Hampshire County. County right that's for Hampshire County so right. we did do that he took that and, and matched it to and it just a easier kind of I don't know cheat sheet to look at right there. yeah just a little cheat sheets rather than having to do the calculation each time exactly does that make sense thank you Annie um so yeah, again, that that graph that he came up with is per is for the Hampshire County numbers to extrapolate to the to the recommendations. So so just that, yeah. Before we move to the next metric, so just to again relate this to our discussion last week, we had um, a bit of a discussion about what the community metrics um, we should we should be using, um, and we talked about case count um, for county as well as case count for town. And I know you'll go through that, but. At that time, the concern around case count for county was how could we could, how could we utilize that very objective count, like the numbers are right there, without also applying a subjective kind of thresholds. And I think what what we're saying here is that this is looking at a metric. Um, maybe you could talk a little bit about the source, um, the path to zero just in terms of that, that serving is really a flagging threshold for us as a guidance, a consideration. So the concern really was around um, that had been brought up was really looking at the, the town data and that becoming a little bit more subjective. So, right. So, and we did have a conversation around that as, are we really getting meaningful information? And just to, just to give an idea. And I think that what i failed to illustrate to last week really well was it doesn't take much to cross the thresholds that um, the state is providing if you look at those color codes. So if you do the math out to calculate um, a rate in Hadley itself, it would take, um, so we have roughly around 5,000 people in Hadley, I, I think, right? Um, so one case in Hadley per 5,000 people, if you um, calculated out that number to a uh, um, equated to 100,000 people, that would be 20 cases. And that would put us into the red zone right away for one for one person, for one case in town. So that's where it kind of become, becomes subject, subjective. And that's what we kind of talked about um, with, 
with the um, Board of Health representative as well, is that it's it's becoming less meaningful because one case, you know, it, it could be it could be up to say even we had talked about like what if a case is you know cases are isolated in a nursing home and there were fifteen or twenty cases in a nursing home. It's not necessarily relevant relevant for us, but it would automatically put us in that red zone. So I. I feel like we couldn't we couldn't use that information objectively, right, in order to get a meaningful number because it would just because our population is so small. Um, and again, if we look at um, Hampshire County too, we're getting just a little bit more broader of a of a picture of what's going on. And if you look at the numbers too for Hampshire County, so if you look at kind of how the the um, little chart here, the zones based on Hampshire County cases that breaks it down. Again, the green zone is anywhere uh, 22 cases in the last 14 days, and the yellow zone is 22 to 223 cases. And last week we were at 14, uh, not 14, 64 cases in 14 days. So it's going to take a lot for us. So, um, so right now we're in that yellow um, yellow zone, and then 224 to 530. It's going to take a lot of cases in order for us to shift through zones, right? Based on where we are right now. Yeah. Okay. And so Tara, so just to make sure I understand. So I like the idea of case count. So you normalize the current cases, the 64 to the population size, the 160, that's where you got the 2.85. That's a daily rate, right? So um, you can calculate out, calculate it out daily, but when we did this, we did it based on the 64 cases was the weekly report that the DPH gave out. Okay, so 64, and we divided that by 14. So that would give you the daily case count. So, okay. so the 2.85 is the daily rate that you is the right daily now. rate. Yep, 2.85 so the daily rate. So then to translate it to this chart, you have to multiply that by 14. No, so if Annie, if you can go back to the previous slide. So if you get that, if you go by the weekly rate that they gave you, the 64, and you get that daily rate of 2.85, you would look at this chart, right? And so this chart, 2.857 or whatever, puts us in that yellow zone, which is one to nine cases per 100,000, which is where okay. we stand right now. So, so that makes more sense. That other chart was what was confusing me with the different numbers. So you'd go back to this original chart. But what's the actual metric? So looking at the, the Harvard, you know, looking at this website, they just say yellow, you pay more attention, you do um, non-medicinal interventions, right? So do you have a particular metric you're saying that we triggers action or doesn't? So um, we would follow based on what is here in say the orange zone. If you're in the yellow zone and you go into the orange zone, which is anywhere from 10 to 24 cases per 100,000, you would have stay at home orders. So what we just, what we had talked about and what we would suggest is that that would be kind of the point where you would say, okay, we're not going to transition into the next phase. We're going to wait another two weeks and reevaluate the data. So, Annie, if you could just go to the, the next slide again, just to show it again, just to make sure that it's clear um, for us, just so that you understand it too, Paul. The zones is based on Hampshire County. So what, what we did was if you look at the yellow zone where we are right now, and if you look at the little um, on the left, the little key there, one to nine cases per 100,000, what Jonah did is he calculated out one case per 100,000 would be 22 cases per 160,000 in the county. And then the upper end of that limit would be nine cases per 100,000 or 223 cases in Hampshire County. So it just extrapolates that information. So it's kind of like, again, like a quick key to look at where we would be in Hampshire County rather than doing the math every time. We don't have to use that little chart. It's just like- uh, it's helpful. Now that you explain it, it makes more sense. Thank you. I didn't sure. try anything. So, so daily rate would... versus two 14 day is kind of what I'm seeing, right? Daily rate is what's captured in the one to nine cases? Correct. Okay. Okay. And I would also and... say where this might answer a question. Last week, the school committee, we were looking at this and having a good discussion about, well, here, here's, here are these data. We want more than simply testing positivity, which we'll talk about next. So how can we make sense of case count? And what I heard the school committee say was, we want to make sense of case count, but we're not epidemiologists. So how do we make sense of case count? And what Harvard Global Health Project has done is said, this is how you can make sense of case count. These are rates of case count 
that should cause you to say, hmm, things are moving in the wrong direction. You can see, again, the reason why we do this by 14 and then again divided by 1.6 is because there's 160,000 people in Hanford County. You can see here that this 2.8, this average daily incident rate, looks like the number that was calculated when you took 64 divided by 14 and divided again by 1.6, that average daily incidence rate. And then the Harvard Global Health Project, and thank you, Jonah, your quick box here, says, and here's how you can make a meaning from that. So what I heard the school committee say previously was we want to make meaning from this, but when is that move too much? When is it we're kind of maintaining? And what the path to zero has done is has provided guidance as to how you can use case count to make decisions about what direction things are going and if you should progress into another phase, maintain a current phase, or if we've gone in the wrong direction, go perhaps go back to a previous phase, right? Does that help? Yep, yep, yeah, I'm good. You can keep going, Tara. And the numbers are pretty liberal there too. Like if you look at them, we'd have to have a significant jump in order to get to there. Um, the other thing that I just wanna say real quick, I'm sorry, is in regards to case count is that when we calculated it out, we used the 64 because it was, it was right it was right there and available to us. We were looking at the weekly data. They do provide that um, daily rate for you on a weekly basis, but you can go in on a daily basis and look. So I looked it up before we met. So today, Hampshire County, um, they reported two cases in Hampshire County. Um, so if you extrapolate that out, that's 1.25 cases per 100,000. And again, leaving us in the yellow zone. So you can calculate it out on a daily basis if you want. Just looking at it from, I mean, we're meeting every 14 days. So looking at that weekly report would be just a little bit quicker math to try to figure out as well. And it gives you, you that. Just take rate the daily rate, rate and divide it by 1.6. Um, yeah, uh, daily rate divide, yeah, yeah. Divided by 1.6. Yep, divided by 1.6, yeah. So then the second thing, which is what we had talked about, was looking at the percent positivity. Um, and so this, again, is also on that same chart um, that the um, DPH provides when we look at that weekly report. So again, it's the same rationale of using the percent positivity, um, looking at the county data to look at social overlap between surrounding um, towns, not just looking at Hadley. And that was on that DPH um, graph again, just a few um, columns down looking at that number. So this is again from the 26th, so Wednesday last week in Hampshire County was lower, I think, than previous. It was at 0.64% positivity. Is that right? Do I extrapolate that right? Yeah, it says yeah. 0.64 and lower change in percent positivity. Yep, yep. And so then um, finding out kind of where we should be with percent positivity, um, you know, it's just as more information is available, numbers, it, recommendations and guidance and information is changing just as information becomes available. Um, but as we know, like, for instance, the World Health Organization started out with a much, much greater range of what they felt like a percent positivity should fall in, and then they dropped it to a lower percentage. Now, again, if we follow the global um the um, Global Institute's recommendations, they're recommending that less than 3% positivity, which makes sense given, again, where we are right now um, at 0.64. If we were to let ourselves go all the way up to five and we're also looking at case count, um, you know, that, that number would be, would be really high. So looking at a little bit more conservative number. And as information comes out, there's more and more recommendations to have a little bit more conservative um, percent positivity threshold. So then um, the last slide is really just why looking at two metrics in particular. So using the metrics, they're looking at slightly different things, but we can use both factors to get a better picture of what's happening with the pandemic in our area, and then um, give us just a better idea of risk assessment and whether or not we need to do something with our school. So looking at things in two different ways gives us just even more information to determine whether or not it's safe rather than just looking at the one measure. So first off, Tara and Annie, thank you for putting this together. Um, a couple of questions. One is what do you see as the big 
difference between a case count on a county basis and a trend of or positivity rate on a county basis? What do I see as the differences? Why we would use those? Is that what you're yeah, asking? Yeah, why are those two, how, how do they differ such that we want two county level metrics? So one is looking at the case count in particular, you're able to see cases a little bit differently and extrapolate numbers a little bit differently when it comes to, um, essentially what I want to do or what I would recommend that we do is look at two different metrics because when you're looking at things from two different avenues, you're having a much stronger assessment of your risk. So if you've got two indicators that are both um, indicating that there's a problem, so the case count is going up and your percent positivity is going up, you've got two things that you're looking at um, independent of one another that gives us um, much more certainty that there's a concern. So I think one thing is that increasing what Sarah said, that, that um, never rely simply on one known risk indicator when making a decision um, about taking an action, like moving forward or staying in the same place or going back. The two uh, pieces of data work together. And in some ways they also allow us to kind of check the validity of each data set, right? So one thing we know about testing positivity rates is when that number goes really high, it's alarming on a whole host of levels, but one of the reasons it's alarming is because it tells us that we, we have inadequate testing. We're not testing enough people, right? Everybody we're testing is sick. Um, and so that our case count, if we're, if we're deriving a tremendous amount of information from case count or relying on that and testing positivity is way up, of course, both those things in tandem should make us say what's going on here. But also our case count is probably not even telling us the complete picture. If that rate is very high, you are not testing enough people. Your testing concentration is hitting primarily just sick people. So this idea of having evaluating two known risk indicators, these are accepted known risk indicators from the Department of Public Health and from other scientists, right? This is how they track um, what's happening with COVID-19 spread in communities. So they look at these two indicators. They look at testing positivity rate and they look at case counts. And um, one, they track community spread. And two, it also lets them know if the, the testing net is kind of being cast wide enough that um, it gives you a sense of confidence in the data that you're looking at. And you would do both at the county level. I mean, we're still going to have to look at Hadley, as I've said, because um, we're going to be aware of what's happening in Hadley. We're going to investigate what's happening in Hadley, but there's no, and I mean, certainly Paul, you know this in your line of work, there's just not, it's, it's what Dr. Allen said to me at the beginning of the conversation. There isn't a epidemiologist or statistician who's going to say that you should look at a count of 5,000 and start making big decisions on a count of 5,000, right? It's just not, the, it's just not a large enough sample size um, for these rates to be meaningful. So I know, so that was the, the next question is you're, you're proposing to eliminate the school-based metric. Uh, I should make clear on that and that's, that's on me. So in, in answering the question about community transmission, um, that's how we're answering the question. To what extent are we, seeing, are we seeing evidence of community transmission that should require the school, that should cause the school committee to reevaluate our current actions, to make a different action. That answers the community transmissions question. I'll go back to those two big buckets, community transmission and school transmission. These two indicators help the school committee because you don't need to rely on the clinical judgment and of the nurses and others or for what you do for school transmission. These two metrics allow the school committee to try to get at that question about community transmission. When it comes to school transmission, we will still evaluate every case in school. And when we see a positive case in school, we contact trace and then we try to figure out, does that case count in school indicate that there's actually school transmission going on? So yeah, this may have been a little bit misleading on the slides. Those two metrics answer the question about Community transmission, I would in no way suggest that we don't evaluate school transmission. School transmission may in and of itself be a trigger. The community could look super. If we have a school transmission problem, 
we need to, for any infectious disease, we would need to shut down school, right? Transmission, not just absolute case count. And just to add on to that, just, just to clarify, because I know that we were looking at um, a little bit more towards town and making, trying to figure out how we could not look so subjectively. We, when we did meet with the Board of Health representative too, um, it, it was clear that we would be able to get information as far as, not information specific, but information as to whether or not um, we should um, take into consideration what the town count is. So that's something that we could still, you know, if town count goes up by X amount, we can still contact and have a very open line of communication with the Board of Health um, as to whether or not that's something we need to be worried about, but it's not something that we would need to measure on a regular, you know, every two weeks looking at metrics. Um, so she did indicate that. And then anything that was directly related to the school, and I don't remember if Dr. Moser said this last week, anything that would directly relate to the school, that would come to um, the school as well, to the nurse, to the um, nurse leadership. Yeah, Dr. Moser did mention that last last week um, in terms of also the privacy considerations and making sure the administration had the information that they needed, um, you know, in order to move forward accordingly, but that we were clear about we don't need more information than we need in terms of, um, you know, any privacy considerations. So, so it sounds like for if we if we're agreeing that there's two buckets right that we're considering one is the community um, transmission information and the other bucket is school transmission data it sounds like really what we're focusing on tonight is an agreement around those metrics for the community transmission uh, data which i think tara you've presented here um, and we've talked about last week really three three levels of metrics right percent positive for county case count for county, and we're not gonna ignore case count for town. It seems like those are the three pieces that we're considering have, making up the picture that we would look at every two weeks with this guidance that you have around what those case counts mean when they fall into categories, kind of using the stoplight technique of red to green or green to red. Um, as well as the extra consideration given, we know that the case count for town can be um, fluid and will be in the red on, on the, the uh, state map if we have more than you know five cases, I think is what our threshold is, right? Because we have, um, we're a small, small uh, town that it's over five that we would be red. So that would be something that would be more subjective. So we would, that would where we would communicate with the Board of Health. Like if we yeah. got X number of cases in town, do we need to worry? And that's where you would put clinical judgment in. The conversation would happen between the school nurse, the, um, the um, school MD um, liaison and the Board of Health. Like, do we really need to worry about that? But then we'd be able to objectively look at the county data and two different metrics, the case count and the percent positive. Yeah. It, it also seems like this meets our request to have metrics that are publicly available um, to any resident. They could follow right along with us. It's, it is, um, I don't believe it's subjective. Um, I mean, Yes, there is a recommendation here about floors and ceilings that are being made, but I don't see that as if it's a system that is back through uh, Harvard and others who have the research behind it, that these are um, not us picking numbers. So it is, to me, clear guidance um, and isn't about, you know, more subjective feeling related uh, decisions. So given that, I feel like it meets what a lot of us were trying to get out there as the concerns. Like we didn't want to have one metric, but we also didn't want to have so many that it was going to be confusing or um, masked in any kind of complicated um, calculations that the public wouldn't have access to. And this seems to me very transparent and um, research founded. So I, I agree, I just a uh, couple of things. So to be clear, we have three metrics and we're saying all three need to be met. There's the school, 
but the school metric obviously wants to, it, school metric doesn't apply to the reopening. I mean, I, well, I guess it does because we'll have students there. So the three metrics, the school specific metric, the case count on a county basis, as long as it's in the yellow on the, the path to zero, the, the Harvard, uh, the, the one to nine um, metric per 100,000 on a daily rate, and then the 3% positivity on a county level uh, as indicated by the uh, weekly trend. Yes. Which, which has a retrospective 14 day look. And that's yes. how they like that. And so, so to be, you know, I just, this always hard for me to get in my head. The case count and the percent positivity are related because to me, they're, they're interesting in combination, right? And so when we talk about these, it's hard to talk about them just individually, right? Because if you have the case count goes up, but the per percent positivity stays stable or goes down, usually it indicates you've increased your testing, right? But if they both go up, potentially there's a higher prevalence of the, the virus in your, that you're testing. So I just think for future discussions, it's hard to just talk about those individually. So if one's sort of saying set, steady and one's going up, well, maybe the testing's improving and uh, the, the, the percent positivity is um, staying stable. That would be an, an indicator. So that's my concern is if we trigger, and I, I think Tara, you've created, or not you, but that yellow box from the path to zero is quite a range, 22 to 223. So there's quite an avenue there. Obviously we're above that, we want to talk, even as we start approaching that, we should be talking, right? And if, especially if both numbers are going up, that's an indication, but a percent positivity stays flat, goes down, um, the case rate goes up, maybe we can justify that by we, we're doing better testing across the population. So all that to say, I think these are good metrics. Thank you, Tara and Annie. Um, uh, just know that while they might be clear metrics, I think as we keep meeting, we need to keep talking about what the numbers mean. I agree. And I think that we need to also keep following new information and guidance as it comes out. So yeah. while this is something that we want to give real clear um, objective information to parents in the district, as more information comes out or if guidance changes, then we would still follow the guidance and make changes as deemed appropriate and safe. But this is the best with what we have right now that we can do. I think that's that's right. I'll just obviously to give people a heads up. And I'll just say, remarking something Humera said earlier, right? I mean, hopefully with soon, there'll be cheap uh, antigen tests that we could administer consistently across uh, students and administration and the public, right? And so, they're not as sensitive as a PCR test, but they're a lot less expensive. You know, if you can get something that's one to five dollars versus twenty-five to one hundred dollars, we could all be doing them bi-weekly and get a sense of. Um, I think that would go a long way to, to mitigate risk. I will say I talked to um, Jeff Hescock from UMass. He runs their testing program because they're doing a great job. I don't know if folks realize, but in the last 25, 26 days, they've they've done fifteen thousand tests, almost fifteen thousand. 100 tests. Um, those are all PCR tests. So they're highly sensitive. They're paying $25 a pot uh, to the Broad Institute in, in Cambridge. Uh, every student on campus or goes on campus is getting tested twice weekly. If you're off campus, you have to get tested routinely. So it's a bit less, um, less rigorous. Uh, Amherst has uh, run, um, let's see, since July, they've run 8,700 tests. And so combined, that's almost 24,000 tests from the schools over the last four to six weeks. And they've had 12 cases, right? So it's 0.05%. It's incredibly low. So when we talk about students concerned that their home address we're not finding out, I'm not sure that's true. We might not know exactly who it is or where they live. And they live off campus completely, never go on campus. Maybe they're getting missed. But I think for the vast majority, these, these folks are getting tested quite rigorously, much more than any other of the populace around here. Um, and the rates are exceedingly low. And the hope is that we're capturing some of that too in the county data too, so that's helpful. Yeah, so if we could set up a system, I called him because I said, how do we do this? Can we set up a system like this? I was hoping he was gonna say, well, we've got these cheap antigen tests that we do, and there are a couple of products on, available that have emergency authorization from the FDA, but they're, uh, they're targeted to hospitals. Like they just came online in the last couple of weeks, but they are, um, sort of very rapid 15 minute antigen tests that we could administer. So if that price comes down over the next month or two, so as we talk about transitioning 
talk about November and December, you know, maybe this we're up and about. This would this would just help us. Uh, you know, I think it it alleviate a lot, alleviate a lot of concerns by people. Yeah, I think this also supports our discussion last week in terms of, um, I think Annie had said only we had nine students outside Hampshire County that are school choice. Every other school choice student in is within the county. So it makes sense that that's, that becomes part of our conversation. All right. Any other Con any concerns or questions about utilizing these metrics? No concerns, just deep appreciation, Tara, for you and Annie um, working with Board of Health, uh, Tara um, tapping any personal familial connections you have <laughs> to um, put it together in such a thoughtful way. Um, it's uh, in essence what you described um, last we can, it made sense to me then, it makes sense to me now. Thank you for putting it together. Ethan, anything? I'm happy, this is great work. I just, I, if I can, I just wanna also shout out the 800 or so tests on the Hampshire College too, no, no positive cases. That's great. Thanks Ethan, I didn't know about those. I'll add that to the mix, that's great. And if we wanna count Smith, which we don't have to, but we can, 535 tests and only one positive, so. The colleges are doing a great job. I'm trying to keep a, a running list. I didn't know Hampshire and Smith had theirs online last I looked. So thank you. I'll, I'll check it out. Not as detailed, but it's there. Yeah. Cool. So our, our next step would be to have a motion um, to approve the recommendation that's been presented here of the metrics for progressing through our reopening phases. Yeah, I support it, and so moved. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Or abstain? Okay. Thanks, Tara. Great. Thanks, Tara. Yeah, great work, Tara, in extracting this. And I, I like the visuals. I, I think it's very helpful. All right. Um, we have, let's see. Uh, we had an additional action item that was, or sorry, discussion item um, that I added at the beginning, which is around the resolution. Um, and Humera, do you want to speak to this resolution that was uh, raised by the Lincoln Sudbury uh, School Committee resolution on testing in the schools, since we're talking about um, COVID testing, not academic testing here? Yes. Um, so, uh as school committee members, we're a part of a network of lots of other school committee members around the state. Um, the Lincoln Sudbury School District is lucky enough to have um, two of its members who are public health experts or officials, very knowledgeable. And they um, shared this uh, document that they um, uh, approved as a school committee advocating for the state uh, to um, a, work on getting inexpensive tests accessible to, uh, to every community for the purpose of getting schools open and operating safely and maintaining their safe operations throughout the year. Uh, B, that they support the school. So I read that to mean, if not financially, don't, don't stand in our way, encourage us and, and uh, support us. Um, and a number of other um, uh, facets. The school committee members shared uh, an article from Harvard uh, Magazine, from the um, Chan um, Public Health uh, Institute, as well as from the um, Harvard Medical School, and also from Science Magazine. And it's, it appears to be a logical way forward that these tests exist, they're coming down in price, that, that they're, could, they could be between $1 and $3. They're not widely available to the public yet, but they could be. And as people who shape policy, we have the ability to um, support something like this, which doesn't cost us anything, but allows us to stand beside 
Lincoln, Sudbury, and also encourage other school committees to do the same. Uh, because, you know, if this goes on for a very long time, we're going to need to have strategies like this that allow for much safer operation. Right now, I feel as though we're really um, uh, operating in the dark and waiting for uh, numbers to spike and, and watching numbers, but with a assertive testing strategy, uh, we could be much more proactive. And um, so I wanna bring this up for us to consider um, supporting because um, in my view, there is no downside and a lot of potential upside if we can shape policy that supports testing. Yeah, I would agree. To be clear, one thing I, I could do as a school committee deliberate with that your next meeting on September 17th, we could take the resolution after listening to your deliberation and then bring a draft forward for the school committee to adopt and sign off on. Right, exactly. Yeah, we want to make sure the resolution becomes part of a packet um, for open meeting. That makes sense. I, I was just going to say, I support um, looking at this resolution and seeing how we could uh, craft our support of it. I think it is in line with what we did back in June, where we did um, support uh, all of the uh, many other districts around COVID-19 state funding um, in terms of being related directly to the messaging regarding um, responsibility and what we need from the state. So I, I think this is in line and I, I look forward to crafting, having it crafted for our district and being able to talk through it. I concur with everything Heather just said. My only question is we're not meeting again till the 17th. Is there any sort of time limitations that we need to consider or is waiting till then okay? I didn't see a deadline. Um, I think we're we're, um, we're among the early ones to advocate for this because the tests themselves are not available outside of hospital use, but we can help influence that policy shift. Um, and I think we should, um, I, I encourage us to look at it early and encourage our colleagues at other school committees and um, through our su superintendent connections to, um, help make that happen because it exists and other countries are doing it and we could have access to it. And clearly our regional uh, university systems have access to something like this. And so it isn't within, um, you know, it isn't reasonable to imagine that we could secure something like this for our school system and our community. Um, and I would even suggest that because we are such a small school and a small community that we could potentially pilot and partner with um, larger public institutions and say, hey, use this as a, a test case of what happens when a small 5,000 person town and parents and, and, and um, educators and students are testing every three days on these $1 kits. Um, what could that look like? I, I think that if we are thinking about this early enough, we could be well positioned to take advantage of opportunities like this, which is a um, much more secure um, data driven risk mitigation strategy. I definitely love the idea of testing. I reached out to those two companies today, Humera, Quidel, and Becton. Um, they're really kind of hard to get a, get a hold of. I, I think they don't want everybody pestering them, uh, but I'll be persistent. Uh, the state, the our governor signed on with a five state, I think it's a six state compact to increase testing. Um, so Annie, you know, through DESE, I know you've got connections there. This is something to advocate with them, right? Um, I like your idea, Humera, of being a, a you know, piloting some of this. Um, I have a couple of qualms about some of the language there. I, I, I love the intent, but it says right out before districts go back into school, you have to do this. I don't, I wouldn't That's want to buy it. Not applicable to us, yeah, not applicable. Yeah. We'd have to but just- Other than that, I really, I love the intent and I love the idea, so. Great, so it sounds like um, looking at this at our next meeting, try to craft it for our sit situation in our district, uh, but building off of what they've done um, in Lincoln Sudbury, that sounds great. So uh, thank you, Humera, for bringing it to our attention. And um, yeah, I think let's see what we can do with it. Great, thank you. 
Great. Okay, um, that was it for presentation and discussion items. We now have some housekeeping stuff to go through. So just reading down our action items. Uh, the first one is the approval of the accounts payable warrants submitted for July 2020. Is there a motion to approve? Motion so to approve. Seconded. All in favor? Aye. 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 I will abstain from that approval. Uh, we also have an approval for the warrants submitted in July 2020. Is there a motion uh, for approval? So moved. Seconded. So All in favor? Aye. Aye. I will also abstain from approving those warrants. Um, we have some sets of minutes. Any questions or um, changes, revisions to the July 27th 2020 minutes or the July 30th, 2020 minutes? Yeah. This is a small one, a small, mm -hmm. small thing. Yeah. But uh, it, the minutes read as though the open uh, comment happened and then I arrived, but I was there throughout. I think because there were okay. a thousand people on the call, I was probably, my image was probably obscured, but just wanted to let you know that, that I was there. We are glad you were. With that revision, um, is there a motion to approve? We'll go with the first of July 27th, 2020 minutes. So, so second. Seconded. All in favor? Aye. Aye. And is there a uh, similar motion for the July 30th, 2020 minutes? So, so moved. Seconded. All in favor? Aye. 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 All right, and we hit our recommendations of metrics already. We talked about athletics and we talked about the handbook as well as the program of studies and the school council process. I believe we have completed everything that was on our list for today. Yay. Done. All right, so um, we're gonna meet again September 17th, uh, 5.30. Note that we are shifting to Thursday meetings um, for those of you joining us still on the line here, that's a, change for us. We typically meet um, Mondays and uh, we're going to be shifting for um, a couple months to the Thursday date. So 5.30 Thursday on September 17th. Is there a motion to adjourn the meeting? So moved. Second. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? <laughs> <laughs> we're abstained. All right. Absolutely Thanks. not. Have a good night. Yeah, that's right. See you Thanks, everyone. Bye. Bye.